We have here today a man can, who can be very helpful to us in the healing process. And for $12 or $15, there's a little therapy on the cheap. So we'll all get on the uh, collective couch here and uh, have a little counseling by the healer, Dr. Amos Wilson. Thank you. Thank you kindly for your, your warm welcome. And I want to say indeed, it's a pleasure to be here again. I always enjoy being here with you and sharing uh, the platform and the time and everything else with you. Uh, it's indeed uh, an honor to be invited by you again to speak on some matters that are, are very great importance to to the whole community. I also want to, of course, thank you for the support you've given in terms of the work uh, that we are doing. And I mentioned we because it's not my effort alone, but the work of a very good friend and partner of mine, myself, along with some, some other uh, dedicated persons at the African World Info Systems. Brother Tyler mentioned some of the books, of course, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, Awakening the Natural Genius of Black Children. Very, very uh, important in the sense that if we are to appropriately educate our children and appropriately socialize our children, we have to understand that's their psychology. Probably the worst approach to trying to educate our children and to socialize our children is to say that they're just like all other children, the only difference is the color of their skin. And we hear a lot of that going on. And while it's, it sounds morally pleasing and uh, it makes us feel at one with uh, the universe and all of that, uh, it doesn't, quit, it doesn't uh, fit the reality. And while people really mean well, when they make those kinds of statements. Uh, it does not fit the reality of things. The reality of things is that uh, our children differ more than uh, merely skin color. As I've often said, the black child is not a white child who happens to be black. I've mentioned to you before, of course, that the psychology of people flows from the history and experience of that people, just as the psychology of the individual flows from his or her unique history and experience. So if you're to understand the psychology of ourselves as a people and to understand our children, then we must understand the history and experience that has generated uh, that psychology. And since psychology to a significant degree is generated by history and experience, why then do we expect our psychology to be the same as that of the psychology of other people who have a very different history and experience? No more than we would expect the psychology of another individual to be the same as our own psychology as an individual, since we know that we as an individual have different history and experience from the other individual, you see. So it becomes very important that we get to know ourselves as people, which means getting to know our history and our culture, and so that we can come to know our children and approach them based on their psychology and their history and on our psychology and our history. And uh, like children, are intellectually born with a head start. And if we took advantage of that natural head start, we would not have to have artificial head start programs, you see. But because we are unaware of the natural head start that our children have, we overlook it, we don't uh, stimulate that, the head start, we don't match it with experience, then we have to compensate for it later on. And we are behind the eight ball then. We're trying to catch up. But if we know the psychology to begin with, 
then we would we we could accelerate and maintain the God-given intelligence of our children. Black on black violence, of course, which is what I'm going to talk a bit about today, is also connected to that psychology as well, and also connected to our having to learn about ourselves and learn our psychology and learn the psychology of those we interact with. We also, of course, need to use that psychology in trying to prevent uh, criminality and reduce criminality within our community as a people. So we are, we are really in the midst of writing a series of connected books. A book that will probably be out in about six weeks, eight weeks, uh, is titled The Falsification and Mislabeling of Black Consciousness and Behavior. Uh, we are talking again about why study history. So a lot of people think history is just a study of dates. You say, and, and uh, reading information of things that happened in the past. That uh, is certainly not the case. History in the human mind is always present. The past is always present. Things that happened to you at one year old, two year old, at when you were three years old, are operating in you right at this moment. And the way you react to other people, the kind of taste you have, the desires you have, the kind of love relations you seek, and all of those kind of things are to a great extent determined by your experience before you were three or four years old. In other words, that experience, those experiences between birth and actually even in the womb itself, but between birth two and three and four years old, operate right now to color your perception of other people, of yourself, to determine to a good degree the nature of your interaction with other people. In other words, then, the past is not something that's dead and gone and dropped off in your mind. It operates right here at this very moment, this very second, and it will operate until the day you die. And it's the same thing occurs in the history of a race. If you look at the history of a race, the way you look at an, at an individual, those experiences that happened to us two and three hundred years ago are not dead and gone by a long shot. The ways we relate to other people, many of our political goals today, many of our social goals right now, many of the things that we desire to achieve as a people come from our experience during slavery. Many of us are sitting here right now wanting to assimilate with white folk, wanting to be one. Many of us are struggling with uh, feelings of inferiority and all of those kinds of things. Where did you think that started? You thought, I think it started here today? It started as soon as we hit the shores of this country. And so the experience of, of ourselves as a group is alive in us. Where else can history be alive but in the minds of people? If people were not in, in existence, what would be the point? We wouldn't even have to be discussing history. Another indication of the importance of history, of course, is the fact that those who rule over us and those who dominate us have worked very hard at distorting our history and at hiding our history from us and at falsifying our history. So if history were not that important to everyday life, to real life and to concrete activities, why then has this nation and the people who rule it worked so hard to destroy African history? Why are they resisting the inclusion of African history and African culture in the educational structure if they, they uh, think that uh, that inclusion is purely harmless from their point of view, you see. In other words, then, we need to gain 
a new appreciation of history and need to recognize that history is always present. And that to a good extent, if we are to change our present behavior, and if we are to change the future, then we must change the past and change our relationship to it. And, we, and therefore, the falsification of uh, and, and mislabeling of black consciousness deals with uh, why we should study history. It deals with history as mythology. And uh, you can recognize in your everyday behavior, if you've been given the wrong history about a person, how that can change your behavior toward that person. Where people have a wrong history about you, they've been given the wrong information about you. People interact with other people based on their uh, history of the other person, you see. If people want to change the nature of people's relationships, they will often falsify the history of one or both of those persons, knowing that one or both of those persons are going to interact with each other differently depending on their history or that sense of the history of the individual. This goes on with groups, ladies and gentlemen. That's why those in power then, you see, rewrite history. Because in rewriting history, they rewrite the person's perception of himself, whose history they've rewritten. They also then change that person's behavior and relationships with other people, given the, the history that they have come to believe. And they also change the way other people interact with those people, you see based on the history that they've learned about the people, you see. That's why any group has to take command of its history and to make sure that it uh, projects the kind of history that operates in its best interest. It cannot let another people write its history and uh, let another people, you see, determine the nature of its history. And it must also know the history of other people as well if it is to, to maintain self-control and self-determination, you see. But history is not a mere remembrance of uh, experience. Everything we've learned, we've learned in the past. You know, if you've learned to talk, you've learned to walk, and any other thing you've learned it when? Not today, you learned it years ago. So if you, in a, in a purely theoretical sense, forgot all of your history and all of your experience, you would return then to a fetal state of existence, to a, a state of immaturity. You would be reduced in your capacity to deal with current and present realities. Many of the coping techniques and things that you've learned in your past would not be useful in, uh, to you because you would not have them at hand. The same thing is true then in the life of a people. We learned a lot of things as African people. We learned to cope with a lot of things. We learned a lot of methods and techniques for solving problems. The forgetting of African history, the not knowing of African history then, breeds in us a certain levels of immaturity and incapacities to deal with problems which confront us today. So you see, history is not a game of just remembrance. History is, 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 is an instrument of power. And when you let another people, as I said earlier, uh, falsify your history, they then will destroy your power and your potential as a people and your capacity to solve your problems as a people. So we're going to be talking about this. We're going to talk about how uh, European history's mythology organize our mentality today as African people and how we have to see European history as a mythology and uh, get a more correct and realistic knowledge of European history as a way of getting a more correct and realistic knowledge of ourselves and as a way of getting in control of ourselves. We are also going to talk about, in that book, uh, a psychology. Why are we labeled as maladjusted and so forth? 
And why do we let another people place labels on us? Why do we let another people call our children learning disabled? Why have not we examined those definitions? To a very great extent, the destruction of our children is taking place because we have accepted without opposition of critical analysis the definition of other people of their behavior. A people who have falsified our history do not know the psychology of our children nor us but yet who are arrogant enough to feel that they can label our behavior and then impose programs on them. You must understand, you see, the labeling of behavior is not a mere designation of certain forms of behavior, but is a form of domination. So when you're permitted to label other people, you also are authorizing certain types of behavior toward those people. You're authorizing the withdrawal of certain rights. You're authorizing restraints and constraints on their behavior. You're authorizing, you see, the uh, taking away of privileges and authorizing the imposition of all kinds of uh, punitive and, and other so-called measures. So labeling children and labeling people's behavior is not something that should be taken easily, uh, uh, something that should be looked upon as purely the work of experts. No, no, you, you, as a people then, we must regain the capacity to label our own behavior and to deal with that behavior within our own context, you see. We have this great genius in our children, and yet we have people in authority labeling them as learning disabled. It doesn't work, and it shouldn't work. That leads me then to the other publication we have coming out here soon. I was talking earlier here to Brother Gus, for instance, just speaking of psychology for a minute, and perhaps we'll elaborate on it in our second session, when we were discussing the issue of um, normality. What is normality? What is identity? You see, can we talk about normal behavior, abnormal behavior, without really examining what it was about? And I mentioned to, to Brother Gus that uh, normality as a concept is more or just as much a political or economic concept as it is a psychological concept. Yet most people think of it as a psychological concept. You see, who defines what is normal and in what way does behaving normally, according to their definition, operate in their interest? You see, so again, talking about normal and abnormal behavior, uh, you're not just talking about designating behavior. Again, behind the labeling of behavior as normal or abnormal is a whole political and economic program. And therefore, behind the whole facade of psychology as a helping profession is really the whole nature of domination and control. In other words, our domination is hidden behind the helping professions, you see, special education, stuff like that. When you look behind it, you'll see political social programs. That's why they don't do any good much. You will look at them. And so we are examining this and we're demonstrating how this works. What do you mean apathetic, apathetic, that black people are apathetic, you know? And when you call apathy a, a uh, psychological problem, you begin to recognize though, as I've said before, in order for this system to operate, black people have to be crazy. Oh yeah. We cannot be in our right minds and be in the condition we're in. That's a political necessity, an economic necessity. 
We talk about apathy, for instance, where people have supposedly do not show an interest in a passion for those things and, and, and activity and knowledge, which if they did so, would change their circumstances. We're left puzzled, you see. Why doesn't this person show an interest in reading and writing and understanding? Because if they did, they could achieve certain things and solve certain problems. And we call that apathy, and we see that as a disturbed mental state, particularly when the opportunity is there for them to do so. But then you begin to recognize that apathy in our people is a necessary state in order for the system to, to operate. That we are not apathetic all over. We're apathetic in certain key areas of life. We'll work all day and night throwing balls and catching balls. No problem there. But we won't work all night at the math, at the reading and the science. You see, so even the apathy is organized. But when you look at it closely, you recognize that it is politically organized. That we are most apathetic and lazy in those areas, which if we were not, we would challenge those in power. You see? If we were not apathetic in technology, economic development, science, political organization, and so forth, then this system couldn't be the same that it is today. In fact, we would threaten and perhaps overthrow those who rule over us, you see. So in those very areas, we must feel very lethargic. It's very hard for us to uh, get the energy to move in those areas. And so we're dealing with that. How do you get a people, you see, set up in a state of mind so that, in a sense, they will not move in the very areas that they need to move to get themselves out of their predicament. So you can see then a black psychology and a psychology from an African-centered point of view uh, approaches the issues very differently. And we must look at these things in a very different fashion than before. And that's what we'll be doing in uh, the falsification and mislabeling of black consciousness and behavior. And we hope then you will uh, support us in this because this is not a personal wealth creating project. I make absolutely not one nickel from the selling of books. Uh, I get no personal income, nor my partners from, from our books. The books are there principally for information and for developing a, a means of communicating very important information to our community and for developing other economic po uh, projects that are important to our community. So in a sense then, in supporting the literature, you are really supporting com a community project, not, not, my, not my personal wealth, of which I have none. <laughs> okay. uh, the last book I'll mention is, well, there are two authors. One I want to mention, of course, that will be coming out soon is called, is, has a working title, A Blueprint for Black Power. And I'm working on the very last chapter of it now. Uh, it was originally a set of 10 lectures that I plan to do in the fall on power. Ultimately, even when we talk uh, about so-called black on black violence, or when we talk about the miseducation of our children, or many of the other problems that we talk so much about, you must come to recognize that to a very great extent, these problems flow from our powerlessness as people. They flow from the fact that we have not developed the power to change our circumstances. And that we will not change our circumstances until we develop real power. There's no other way around it. 
trying to get other people to have goodwill and love between sisters and brothers ain't going to work. I'm telling you, it's not going to do it. You got to have power to even get them to, to believe that. Powerful people don't pay much attention to the sermons of the powerless. No. Preaching and ranting and raving at those other folk uh, is not going to have much influence on their behavior. Why should they pay you any attention? You don't represent anything. Okay. So you got to have power to even convince them to love you. <laughs> To be brotherly and to be sisterly. Why should I be sisterly to you? What does it mean? You can't do anything to me. That's what they say. You can't do anything for me. So what's the point? Why should I love you? What I have to gain by loving you? Yeah. So a lot of us, you know, think that we can just preach the enemy into submission. It ain't going to happen. But if you got some power behind what you're saying, things happen, you see. People listen to powerful people, don't they? If we want to be heard, if black people have a different message, if African people have a different message, a different philosophy and ideology, then African people must back that ideology up with power. But as long as you don't have any power, your message can be as beautiful and as wonderful as you want it to be. Nobody's going to hear you. No, that's going to pay you any mind. See, a lot of people here were quite perturbed about the the gay initiative in terms of the U.S. Army, and you got a lot of discussion about whether they should be in the army or outside of the army, and all of this other kind of stuff. But I think what was missing in that discussion was not the morality or the immorality of the deal, was how did this group of people get their agenda to be almost number one on the uh, president's uh, list? You know, regardless of what you may think about them as persons or the movement, that becomes an issue. Why is it that black people who outnumber gays and all of this other stuff cannot get a black agenda? in the presidential situation. You say, that to me was the issue. How can this minority of people, and for some people, how can this stigmatized group of people move a president to push against the grain that way? To me, that's worth an analysis there. You see? And here is a group of people who, didn't, who are not running away from their identity despite the fact that that identity may be ridiculed, and despite the fact that they may be attacked for being identified as what they are, and so forth. But I find it interesting that instead of trying to hide it by saying, I am a human being, I am an American, I, you know, all these labels we use to try to hide who and what we are. What do they say? We're here, we are queer, and we're in your face. You know, now do something about it, you see. And as a result of that, what happens? Things what? Move, you see. And it shows and it demonstrates something. You don't gain by running and hiding and denying who and what you are, no matter whether people like you or not. You stand up for who you are and you speak loud about who you are. I'm black and I'm proud. This is what it's about. I'm an African person. This is who I am. I don't give a hoot whether you like it or not. You're going to have to deal with it. This is how you get agendas on programs and you move things forward. Not by hiding and sneaking and abstracting yourself. You see? But being real and putting power behind your reality. The gays, I think, are having a parade here today, aren't they, in D.C., where they promised to have a million strong up there. Well, what is that about? Demonstrating what? Strength. That's what a demonstration does. It says, hey, it's just not one person speaking, two people speaking. When we speak, there are what? Millions behind us. That's why you make marches. That's why you have demonstrations. 
This is like when you when you show the enemy your army. It's okay. You know, here we are. We have what? Strength of numbers and commitment behind what we say. And people what? Listen. You see. And this is the thing that African people have to do. We stand up as Africans and we demonstrate as Africans and we demonstrate power. And so we're going to be talking in detail about how we build power in this world and demonstrate our power and use our power as African people in our own interest. We must study power. Many of us are afraid to talk about it, you see. We've been made, uh, too many of us in our churches, to see the pursuit of power as something sinful and terrible. But it takes power to be alive. If you have no power, you're dead, just like a battery. Power is, is the essence of life. There is no life without power, you see. And therefore, if you want to stay alive, maintain your life, enhance your life and your survival, then you must develop power and, and, and maintain the power to do so. Otherwise, it won't happen. You can't do it without power. And somehow someone is trying to convince us that, that this is the case. We're afraid to talk about power. We're afraid to talk about wealth. You know what I'm saying? And because of that, we are poverty stricken in too many ways. When in the later section, we'll come back to this. But we're going to talk about power. The final book that we've done, and will probably be coming out in the fall, Educating Black Children for the 21st Century. What is an African centered education? What is that about? It's about far more than black history and, and, and African culture. There's much, much more. In fact, the African-centered point of view covers every aspect of life. When you educate people in terms of Afri African-centeredness and you socialize children in terms of African-centeredness, you apply this perspective to every aspect of life, not just to history, not just to culture, but you, you apply it to economics, human and personal relations, institutional building, and the whole bit. It fits in every area of life. And so when we talk about an African-centered education, we're not talking about an African-centered education that only deals with the raising of self-esteem or getting people only to know their history. This is an education for power. This is an education for economic development. This is an education for nation building. This is education for liberation, you see. This is an education for love, cooperation, all of these other things. And therefore, if we are going to truly educate our children, we must then bring it to being an African-centered education that educates the whole of their personalities and selves, not just aspects and parts of them. And so we're going to go into, into that. In the meanwhile, I want to urge you to read Brother Koto's book on nation building. You may not be familiar with it. I hope it's on sale out there. Is it on sale out there, Brother Gus? Okay. Look it up. Very, very important book. I recommend it highly. A great idea of what an african centered curriculum really involves is contained in that book. I'm including a copy of his curriculum in my own work because it fits uh, very much what we talk about when we talk about an African Senate education and what it's about. And because in the end you cannot truly talk about African Senate education unless you're talking about nation building and unless you're talking about building a pan-African global economic system and social and political system, you see. You don't start talking about the appropriate education of children by, uh, based on negatives, you know, what they are not learning in school, why they are not reading, why they are not learning math. As I've said before, education is not for children, actually. Education is for the nation. And you start with the issue of what problems must the nation or must the people solve. 
That's where you start. What problems are we confronted with as people? What economic problems are we confronted with? What political problems are we confronted with? We're confronted with the problem of oppression. We're dealing with the other problem here today, black on black violence. These are problems that we must solve as people. Then we start asking ourselves the question, what kind of people must we become in order to solve the problems that confront us? You say, this is where curriculum development begins, not with what the kids are not getting. You say, then you follow that up with saying, then what kind of institutions and social relations and attitudes must we develop among ourselves so that we can be the kind of people we need to be to solve the kind of problems we must solve as people. And then you follow that up by asking the question, what kind of educational and socialization experiences must we undergo as adults and as children so that we can become the kind of people we need to be and develop the kind of relationships we need to have and the kind of institutions that we need to have to solve the kinds of problems we have, you see. And you can see then your curriculum develops out of that, you see. Then you look at the developmental psychology of your children and you see at what point they are most ready to gain from particular educational and socialization experiences. When are they most ready to be taught reading and so forth, you see? And then you match then their education and socializational experiences with their level of readiness, with their developmental psychology. So you can optimize their learning and their ability to internalize what they need to internalize in order to become the people we need for them to become to solve the problems of the nation, you see? This is where you go in terms of developing a curriculum, not the other way around, where you say, well, they're not learning this, they're not learning that, and the next thing you know, you're trying to put in a program here and a program there and a program here, and just got a patchwork of programs that really in the end does not resolve the issue. And even if the programs are successful, you'll find that you will educate children and educate people who can solve the problems of other people, but not solve their own problems. Because they are being educated to resolve the problems of other people and not their own problems. They're being educated to get a job. Jobs owned by whom? Others, not themselves. Instead of being educated to do what? Create jobs. Make jobs. Develop employment opportunities. That's what an African-centered education does. It just doesn't educate people to, uh, to higher levels of servitude to others. No, no. African-centered education makes opportunity for African people. It creates jobs for African people. It creates economic institutions for African people. It builds houses for African people. It doesn't teach people how to beg for them. It teaches people how to build. It's an African-centered education, you see, appropriately developed. If our problem is unemployment, then an African-centered education educates its people how to create employment for themselves. That's what an African-centered education does, you see. So see, it's not just about reading and writing and self-esteem. It's a part of the whole survival mechanism of a people. And this is what we'll be talking about in educating African children for the 21st century. This is the kind of program we're trying to develop. These are not intellectual uh, play games. These, these are real prescriptive approaches to problems and issues. And I've taken this time, which I should not have, but to sort of uh, introduce you to the kind of things that we're trying to do and uh, to, to hope that uh, you'll continue to support us 
and that you yourself will contribute to this movement. We need a lot of writing done. This is an information age, and we need a lot of information, African people. And we need a lot of written information. While I can understand our celebration of the African oral tradition, and that has its place, but after all, we must face the reality that we are operating in an electronic communications age. And while there is a place for our oral tradition, we cannot become solely dependent on oral, uh, the oral passing of information. We must become the generators of information and use every type of information dissemination available to us. That includes then not only oral uh, dissemination, but it includes, of course, the, the literate dissemination of information, the electronic dissemination of information. To a great extent, those races that will survive throughout the next century or past the next century will be those races who have an edge on information and on its use, who can generate it, who have control over it, and who can use it to their advantage. And we need a lot of information. There's not enough information out here flowing to our people. Let's get to the subject matter at hand. Black on black violence. I don't have to reiterate to you, of course, the problems you're dealing with them. I saw this morning in the Dallas Morning News, you're still doing an analysis of the fracas that went on around the the celebration there of the Dallas Cowboys, I believe. And of course, certainly Waco is fresh on your mind. And the fact is that in the last few years, you've had quite a rise in, in violence in the community, both in this city, Houston, and in other places. And violence uh, is occurring all across this country. A recent study by the National Crime Analysis Project at Northeastern University indicated here, as published in the uh, New York Times in October, last October, that the number of 17-year-olds arrested for murder climbed 121% from 85 to 1991. And we know it was very high in 1985. The number of 16-year-olds arrested for murder climbed, uh, rose 158%. But the highest increase, 217%, was in the arrest of 15-year-old youngsters. And even the number of arrests for boys 12 and under has soared 100% since 85. So we can see that we are facing an epidemic here, a sort of crime epidemic. One of the experts indicated that what we've seen in the past few years is nothing compared with what we'll see in the next decade and on into the next century as the resurging adolescent population mixes with changes in our society in our culture. The arrest rate for murders did decline from 80 to 85 as the percentage of young people fell. But since 85, there's been a 24% increase in the, in the homicide rate and a 36% increase in overall violent crimes, largely because of the unexpected upsurge of violence among young boys. And we see here then these youngsters are, are killing each other, mainly due to the drug epidemic among, they mentioned here, the urban poor, the growing number of firepower, number and firepower of guns, the eroding quality of public schools, and the glorification of violence on television and in the movies. This, of course, we are familiar with, so I will not... Uh, reiterated too much, 
But people are not shooting people, and our youngsters are not shooting youngsters. And a generation of young men, before they can even become men, before they can can uh, develop careers, before they can support families and so forth, are dead. We uh, this kind of violence is not merely random violence. It's not violence that just flows up from some kind of criminal personality within our youth. This violence occurs within various contexts. Violence, like any other psychological behavioral class, is the outcome of, of the interaction between particular states of consciousness of person. People who engage in violence are people who are operating in a particular state of mind. They have a certain type of consciousness. They have certain types of attitudes, perspectives, and values and feelings that they exhibit toward themselves as persons, that they exhibit toward each other and toward the world. And so we are to come to understand the so-called prevalence of black on black violence in our community. We must also come to understand then the consciousness that is prevalent within our community and that is prevalent among our youngsters. The attitudes, the values, the perspectives that they have, the way they look at each other and look at the world. These states of mind, of consciousness, these perspectives themselves reflect historical, cultural, economic, political, and physical environmental circumstances. To a very great extent, we are deceived by those who write about crime merely as a psychological state, and a psychological state that is unconnected to what else goes on in the world. There is no psychological state unconnected to the rest of the world. What's the point of talking about it, except in terms of its connectedness with what is going on? Psychological states themselves then reflect political economic circumstances. This is the reason why I mentioned earlier, if we are to come to understand our psychology, but as well as to understand our behavior, we have to understand our history and culture. We have to also understand economic circumstances. But you see, for a group of people who want to condemn us and make us criminal by nature, these other things are left out so that they can now talk about us as, you, as is the current style in terms of our genetic background, as if violence is implanted in our genes. So even while we had a black secretary of health, we had a government up there trying to talk about the fact that it was going to study the relationship between genetics and violence. A pathetic situation, by the way, isn't it? I was at one of these conferences at Columbia University, uh, and it says, you know, the question I asked, filled with white folk and white experts, you know, if you're going to study the relationship between violence and genes, then why are you studying black folk? <laughs> and isn't it interesting, as I will point out here later on, in the face of the tremendous record of violence of Europeans, that we see black folk and black youngsters and black young men as the subject matter for studying a relationship between genes and, and violence. What a joke. But we get these kind of jokes all the time. Yeah, all the time. It's an amazing feat that uh, the most violent people in the world and the most criminal people in the world are taken as models of sanity. And their victims are seen, you know, as models of criminality. It's, it's just, but that has, that's the way it has to be under an oppressive system. As I will talk a little bit later, everything has to be done what? Turned what? Backwards. Everything's turned backwards, you see? 
Oh, they were studying gangs. And again, ask them, if you're studying gangs, why are you studying black youngsters? You know? You know that the army is one of the biggest gangs in the world? Yes. What are armies? Big gangs. Yes. Big gangs, mostly of men, who go and rob other people and nations of their wealth, who terrorize other groups and nations. You see? But again, you see, we are deceived by words. Of course, that's why they don't want to teach your children to read, you understand? And I want to teach you to really understand words in depth, you see, because then you sweep this. What are you talking about, Armin? This is nothing but a gang. What do, what do you mean? Here? This is nothing but a gang. What do you mean, government? This is a mafia operation. Oh, yeah, you, you think because the government has a constitution and a bunch of laws, it's legitimate. Are you crazy? <laughs> this is not a legitimate government. This is a gang of people here who came over and did what? Took other people's lands, took their lives, and then they made a constitution and deceived us into thinking they were legit. Are you kidding? <laughs> See again, you think it's turned around, right? You talk about the glorious history of the Vikings. What are these? Marauders, gangs. Running around, they, 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 they thought planting and, and farming was a feminine activity. So what do they do? They let other people plan and farm, and then they go around knocking people in the head and taking their stuff. We can go on with this. We don't have time to do it. I just want to, you know, sort of break your mind open a little bit and just sort of alert you to not following words and labels so easily, you see. You know, so you, 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 you call it an army and immediately you forget that this is a gang. You see? Or you call it national interest and don't forget that and forget that this is a mafia operation that says Central and South America is our territory. And we don't want anybody else messing with it. Of course you call that the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> It's a mafia doctrine. <laughs> That's all it is. And the Central and the South Americans have what? Not a thing to say about it. And the instance they say, well, we want to elect our own government. We want to, hey, wait a minute, hold on. If it's not in line with what we want, uh-uh, we're going to do you in. How different is that from a drug gang that moves into a community and tells the community, this is our territory. They don't own a house or a stick in it, but it's their territory. And when people say, well, we want to walk the street peacefully, we want this and that. No, no, no. You can't do that. This is, this is for, for us. You see? But again, you see, when you're not alive to yourself, you don't have an African-centered perspective and, a, and an African consciousness and so forth, then you, you will study your victimology as if it is a cause and not a result. And therefore be further victimized which is why the problems never get solved, you see? And why the education never seems to work, okay? So we have to understand this. So the understanding of violence in the African community requires that we come to some understanding of its causal circumstances and rearrange or eliminate them in ways which reduce or eliminate violence. This is what is required here. We want to look at violence then in, in three contexts, in the cultural context of violence in America as a whole, the cultural context of violence in black America, and in the ecological context of violence in black America. And I'll move rapidly through this and we'll go into the details uh, uh, in, in the next session. America began as an act of violence. America as a nation is rooted in violence. 
which is one of the reasons why it is one of the most violent nations on earth, whether you're talking about black or white. You see? As I said earlier, don't let that constitution fool you and all of this democracy stuff talk and uh, deceive you. What are its origins? The origins of America are criminal. And it therefore is what I call a crimogenic society in that it breeds criminality because it is rooted in criminality. Why are you surprised? What are the two major acts of criminality that brought this country into being? The first one, of course, is what? The criminal destruction of Indian nations. Rape and robbery and thievery. Taking of lands and taking of wealth. Destroying of people's cultures and nations. Placing people in prisons called reservations. Slandering their culture and their character as people. This country is built on it. I don't give a hoot whether you love it or not. It's what it's built on and that's the reality of it. And why can I call it a crime? Because I can call it a crime based on the white folks themselves. They came over here with the Bible in their hand, didn't they? They came over here uh, touting something called the golden rule, didn't they? Do unto others that you would have them do unto you. Okay, so don't tell me they didn't know any better. They would not have had that done to themselves. And yet they did it to others. And so within the context of their own cultural definitions and within the context of their own religion, they were criminals. Okay, and we have to face that. Of course, the next major crime was the enslavement of African people, was the destruction of African civilizations. You talk about the disruption of the black family, as if that disruption occurred since the 1960s and 70s. The disruption of the African family began with slavery. That's where it started. And the disruption of African culture, the disruption of social relations and arrangements and institutions of African people began with slavery and it has not stopped yet. And yet millions of our people died in this process and were killed in this process. And we have an endless history of death, damnation, and destruction. The coercion of our people into work a slandering of our culture and a slandering of our character, the lynching of our people, the physical abuse of our people, the racial discrimination against our people, all of these things with which we are familiar have been practiced from day one in this country. And these practices are criminal. And therefore America is rooted in this criminality. But see, America won't face this reality. And many of us won't face it. And we won't come to terms with it. And yet, we go to these churches and we talk every day about the fact that people are not saved unless they what? Repent of their sins. Yes. Repent. The old rich man ran to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? Give your money back to the poor, you thief. <laughs> he didn't do it, though, did he? <laughs> but that was the thing. Look, you got to give it up. You got to give it back. You got to repent. You got to admit. But you see, we as black people want to uh, 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 put that rule on ourselves, but we don't demand it on those who misused us. And if they do not reparate, and if they do not repent, if they do not come to terms with the sins enumerated by their own book, the book that they laid on us, then they will suffer, and as they suffer, we will suffer. 
I'm telling you. But we don't want to deal with that. See, we want somehow God to overlook white folk. You <laughs> see? It ain't going to happen. We think somewhere down the road these writers are going to really share something with us. I tell people this. That thing is very interesting. The rich man runs says, what should I do to be saved? And he says, uh, give the money back to the poor, you know. Joker ran out. And I said, look, if you think that Jesus is God, isn't it interesting that this man looks God right in the face? He says, it ain't happening. Okay. And Jesus says he got as much of a chance of getting into heaven as a camel through the eye of a needle, right? I say that for you people who sit around here thinking one day good news is going to strike this white man's heart. <laughs> and he's going to share equally his wealth and power with you just out of the goodwill and goodness of his mind. If he can look your God, if the rich man can look God in the face and say no, you know doggone well, then these folk can look you in the face and going to say no. So you got to figure another way of dealing with it, another way of approaching it. You, 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 don't, you may as well give up waiting for that great day when somewhere this white is going to find it this hard to share what he has with you. That's why you got to study power. You got to take it. Yeah. And this violence perpetrated by whites. It was not, again, just violence, random violence. Always when you have violence, you have a mythology that rationalizes and justifies what you're doing, you see. And it's interesting to look at mythologies. The mythology of conflict resolution that they have. And that, that, that mythology is a part of America even today. How do you resolve com uh, conflict? Take it out and shoot them. Where did we get that from? Frontier justice. <laughs> You're right in the middle of it. <laughs> the old Western mythologies. You know, people have never really stopped to study how much violence really went on in the West. You'd be surprised. Not nearly as much as you think. Nah, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at how much lying has gone on about the cowboy and the, you know, and all that stuff. In fact, it's interesting if you read some of the current, some of you may be familiar with the current struggle going on over Sam Houston, right? Since you're here in Texas, huh? You know, somebody wants to build a statue for him somewhere out there. Then there's another group that says, no, not for that old drunkard. He was a drunkard, you know. And it's, yeah, a drunken sod came right into Texas here trying to be big man. Sorry to dump on your land here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ne'er do well looking for a new opportunity in the land of Texas. A bad general, too. Running like hell from, from Sidon and the other people there. No. Oh yeah, check check the real history out. You see? Now you got your what is it, your fourth largest city in the country or whatever, named after Sam Houston. But you haven't really studied who Sam Houston was. What a rascal he was. How he was not really thought that well of by many people. How the battle he won was more by accident than it was by design and plan. Yeah. The whole bit. All kinds of myths have been generated to what? To justify this nation. So the myth of the chosen, that these people were chosen by God in some way to rule the earth. The myth of what it means to be a man, you see. All of these kinds of myths 
have become a part of American folklore, but they're just not folklore. They become a part of people's ways of behaving and relating to other people. Real men don't take no stuff. You know, and he or she dissed me, you know. And how do you resolve that? You know, you go for it. Because that's what? The American way of solving problems, you see? And there's a mythology there. People not only dominate other people, they rationalize that domination. They make an excuse for dominating other people. So the whites had to rationalize the, their immoral behavior that was even condemned by their own Bible and by their own God. They had to rationalize the murder of Indians and the enslavement of black folk. And in order to rationalize it then, they had to create a racial mythology that we were born to be slaves. You see, so they're not doing anything wrong. This is right in line with God's plan. They brushed off that old dusty myth of Ham to try to convince themselves and us that somehow in the divine order of things, we were designed to, to be the servants of others. And yet even the reading of that thing itself does not say that at all. But people believe it because this is a part of the racial mythology that has been laid down, you see. And so many of us are willing to forgive those other people for what they've done and ask nothing from them because in a sense we've subconsciously internalized these kind of mythologies, you see, that somehow we are people who are supposed to be the servants of other people. And that's one reason why we think that they're going to be exempted from the law. The Indians were destroyed because they were what? Savages. <laughs> okay? They're the savages. They're the ones without civilization. They fed you when you got in, would have starved to death, maintained the white colonies and so forth. And what thanks did they get for it? Death. Why? Because they were savages. So again, what do you got? Oppression, things being doing, then what? Turn around, turn backwards. You see, the victim is made to appear to be the perpetrator. You see, and this is what mythology does. Mythology seeks to what we call naturalize history. To make what is appear to be what is natural or what has been divinely ordained by some natural order or by some divine order. And so we get a mythology. Not only though do people uh, build a mythology to justify what they're into, they act in terms of the mythologies that they develop. <clears throat> the mythology of racism and the mythology that was built around black people is used to justify segregation, justify discrimination, justify all forms of misbehavior toward us as a people. Once you use that mythology and use the mythology to create an environment, you actually then begin to create behavior as a result of placing the person in a particular environment, you see. And this is what happens. You put people in a particular environment, after a while, that environment is reflected in their behavior. You put a person in prison, you keep them in prison, they learn to be criminal. Yes, and we know prisons are schools for criminality. But you see, the process of putting them in is overlooked. The process of creating the environment is overlooked. What you do is count noses after you've done it. He said, oh, well, you know, so many of them are arrested for violence. That means they must be violent. But the whole process of how did it happen is not dealt with. I deal with something in black on black violence I call the structuration of crime. What am I trying to say there? Simply because a man mugs someone else doesn't mean he's more criminal than a man who swindles. 
even though we are we are often convinced of that. Often crime is not irrational, but a rational process. People weigh, you know, they weigh all kinds of options often when they engage in crime. When you've robbed a person of education, you've robbed them of job opportunities and possibilities, locked them in, in what amounts to reservations, If they had the same level of criminality as a person who has a degree in accounting, works as a vice president of a bank, they're going to create two different sorts of crimes, not because they, one is more criminal than the other, but because of the structure in which they both reside. As I've said before, it's crazy if you are an accountant and you have control of the money and you can electronically transfer millions of dollars to your own account for you to go out in the street and knock somebody in the head for a few nickels. <laughs> you have what? Different options. <laughs> Not that you're necessarily less criminal. Your object is the same to do what? Get money. You look at your options. So, hey, man, I can transfer this, doop, 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 doop. I got a million, I'm done with it. <laughs> but another man who's not what? Sitting at that position, is not in that place, looks at his options. Well, I either got to break into a house, knock somebody in the head, <laughs> you know, one way or the other, you see. And yet we don't talk about, you see, how so-called black-on-black violence and, and the criminality in our community is structured by the very system itself. You see, how placing and restricting our people under certain circumstances and restricting their options, we literally dictate the types of crime that they will commit when they commit them. And then we want to talk about their violent nature and try to connect it with their genes. See, when these writers were begging and, and, and poor and weak, over here in this country, they didn't hesitate to kill and mug the Indians, did they? To rape and rob and steal and do whatever they could. Once they got it under control and passed their mafia rules, they didn't have to engage in that anymore. They used their army police force and other kind of things to do that. And then they can look like they are less violent and less, you know, this and that. Why? Because they're less criminal? No. Because their options are different. You see? And in the way that we to change the nature of so-called criminality, as I told people, look, you want us to get out of violent crime, let us become accountants. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we'll, just, we'll just run a good SNL scandal on you. But we won't hit anybody in the head, you know. Or shoot anybody. But it's very important for us to understand as we got to rush through here. Uh, but we got to look at these kind of things, you see, before we just jump up and make moral condemnations and, and, and make psychological condemnations of people and other kind of things. You, that's why, you see, you got to be African-centered in your education so that you can perform the right kind of analyses and things. But when you let other people teach your children, you let other people teach you, they're going to teach you and educate you into ignorance and into stupidity, I'm telling you. And into blindness and distort your perception and capacity to see what is going on. And you join with them in condemning yourself and your children, you see. And you will think that the only thing that needs to be changed is some kind of moral relationship here, uh, an outcome. No, there, there are political and social and economic changes that must occur if we are to change things here. So to a great extent, the crime that's created in this world is created as a result, particularly in terms of the so-called black community, of uh, the structuring of this society by white domination and the mythology that it projects to justify that domination. Most of all, it's structured by the whites' denial of their own criminality and their own criminal behavior and, by, and their projecting of their own criminality onto their victims. 
So the Indians become the savages, even though they were minding their business before you got in. They were alive, they had their nations. But now you say that they were killed because they were savages. You see, so the whole thing gets turned around. Tremendous psychic violence, which I think is even worse than physical violence, was visited on our people. We don't have talk, time to talk about this today. Why do we think of black people anyway as more criminal? Let's look quickly at this game and see how it's played, this projecting of criminality. The political paradox is, as stated in the Wall Street Journal in August 1992, people with the least to fear from crime drive the crime issue. Appeals to suburban whites highlight split between perception and reality. In other words, people who are least threatened by crime are the first one to talk about it. <laughs> and the people who are less threatened directly by crime are the first people that the politicians talk to and generate fear in about crime. You had Clinton talking about the hiring 100,000 police officers. And yet, the perception of crime and the, and the public's perception of crime and the reality of crime uh, remain far apart. In 1990, whites committed 54% of all violent crimes while blacks committed 45%. The rate of increase in the incidence of violent crime over the past decade has been the same among blacks and whites. But why do we get this image of black folk as being the criminal folk, you see? Moreover, violent crimes between races are by far the exception. Black people are not out here wholesalely attacking white folk. Black folk are victimized more by other black folk than by anyone else, and so are white folk. In 1998, 92% of violent crimes committed against whites were committed by other whites, while 84% of violent crimes committed against blacks were committed by other blacks. So why do we get this image here of some black folk stalking in the shadows, uh, uh, looking to victimize white folk more than they victimize themselves? Why is crime even talked about with that image anyway, you see? You must recognize then that there's a political game going on here, a psychological game, a mythology being created, a managing of image to justify domination, a managing of image to justify unemployment and to justify locking people in inner city reservations and to justify the continued control of the lives of African people by non-African people, going against the very facts that these people themselves collect, you see, and know better. And while the, and, and if we look at a couple of other things here, the American Medical Association published ran in June 1992 a battery of some 70 studies indicating that the greatest increase in gunshot deaths has been among white men and women in large and small cities with black men and for black men in small cities. Among white men and women in inner city, the, uh, that is violence among white men and women in the inner cities rose by about 30%, slightly more than blacks. So where do we get this image here then, that blacks are in the vanguard of criminality in this country? And why do we, as black people, buy this? Doesn't mean that we are not engaged in violence to police, I'm not saying that, but why is it that we have this one side uh, image? TV is promoting this perception. Why do we have the image of the white woman is being victimized by the hulking black man. When a recent study indicates it found that women of any age were far less likely to be uh, victimized and the victims of crime than men. In fact, black males are by far the most frequent victims of violence. For every 1,000 black males over the age of 12, 53 have been victims of a violent crime. That compares with 35 white males 
28.2 black females and 21.3 white females, but yet we get this image of Miss Helpless, you know, being uh, brutalized and overrun by black men. We have to face what's going on here, ladies and gentlemen. We have a game being played on the minds of our people, a game that is used to justify uh, violence. I wish I had time, we don't have time to talk about the increasing violence in white suburban schools that's occurring, and the increasing violence occurring in white rural schools of uh, places like Dartmouth, Massachusetts, where uh, white boys walked into the classroom with a bad knife and everything, walked directly into the class while the teacher's teaching to stab another student to death. And they say, oh, we thought this only happened in the inner city. Well, it's happening all over because America is a violent society on the whole, you see, and this violence is around, but we don't hear much about that. When we talk about violence, as I said earlier, why do we look at ourselves only? A few instances of how whites rationalize their control and how they project their criminality on other people, I think, can be illustrated by the following set of facts. That white males are arrested more, whites are arrested more for violent crimes, including murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault than blacks. More arrested for property crime, including burglary, larceny, motor vehicle, theft, and arson. More arrested for drug abuse violation, weapons carrying, possessions, forgery, and counterfeiting. Offenses against family and children. Most sex offenses, driving under the influence, disorderly conduct, liquor laws, and runaways. How do we get this image then of the black criminal man as being what it is today? I cannot fail to mention the crimes of the white male against black humanity in the forms of wars of conquest, colonization, and ongoing oppression, of wars using African puppet proxy armies, and white and black terrorists and mercenaries, repressive neo-colonial governments, against African populations. These war crimes perpetrated by the white male have produced murder casualties and maimings in the millions. If you read a current book by Brzezinski, who I think was what, Secretary of State or something under uh, Nixon or so forth, he has a book now, let's see, in fact there are two out now. One, Pandemonium, I believe, I may have it mixed up, that's written by um, Monaghan, and I forget the name of the one that is written by Brzezinski. These people are coming face to face with the fact that we are not facing a new world order, we are facing a new world disorder. And they're coming face to face with the fact that ethnicity is not going away. It never went away and it ain't going nowhere. And that a serious mistake is overlooked. When is, is made when you do not deal with ethnicity and with uh, 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 religious philosophy and so forth. When you look around the world, this is what you see. This is what's happening in the world. And now they're trying to deal with it. Brzezinski, I think, makes the statement that in the 20th century, essentially, these Europeans have perpetrated the death of 167 million people. And I said earlier that, why are we looking at the African-American gang member trying to study him in terms of uh, genetics and crime? Despite all of this, the media has successfully created and maintained an image of African, particularly African-American males, as the greatest menace to life and limb. I have to sum it up here, but this is the kind of cultural context in which black on white violence takes. And we have to look at it within that context. This violence has created a lot of the violence that we see today, alienation 
and created the, the emotions, alienations, anger, hypersensitivity, inferiority com uh, complex, which becomes a source of much misbehavior, including violent behavior. This constant propaganda about our people being a criminal people, about the black male being a criminal person, about black people being inferior and so forth, has been internalized by too many of us. And once we internalize that racism, we act toward each other as a white racist would act toward each other. I've indicated to a great extent the black on black criminal is essentially a white racist in black clothing. Because what? He feels and has the same attitude toward his fellow black that a white racist has. We don't have time today to talk about the role of identity and what identity means and what consciousness means, you see. But then you can hear, if you ride the subways in New York City, you can hear our young men using the same words that we here in the South would not, never have used in public. And we would never have allowed ourselves to use in public, you see. But people who now have identified and have uh, with whites and have inter internalized their attitudes, the same attitudes that whites have internalized toward us, then feel quite free to engage in violence. We have to look at adolescence, the whole issues of adolescence, when people are struggling for power, when young people are struggling with frustration, when they're trying to struggle with their ethnic and sexual identity, when they're trying to gain peer acceptance, when they're concerned with status symbols, boredom, norms, and so forth, and how that feeds into to, uh, uh, the so-called violence that we're talking about as a people. And what have we done to deal with the crisis of adolescence? A quick look then at what I call the ecological context of violence. A recent study was done here in New York demonstrating that 75% of the of those in prison were generated from seven neighborhoods in New York City. In all of the for, from, from all, all over the state, seven neighborhoods generated by 75 percent of the prisons prisoners in prison there, indicating that there's something about the ecology of those neighborhoods. There's something happening in those neighborhoods generating a criminality. And of course, you know, I don't have to name the names, Harlem, Bedford Stuyvesant, Brownville, and other names which are very familiar to us. What is going on in those places? You see, violence that begets violence is facilitated when there are no mitigating influences. That is, influences that stand between the person and violence. In other words, if we had a correct e ethnic history, a correct ethnic uh, culture and knowledge of ourselves and ethnic consciousness, if we had appropriate educational institutions, if our family compositions were what they should be, if our employment and incomes were what they should be, then violence would be reduced in our communities. You see, what we call social institutions are not things people just happen to create. Social institutions are instruments created by people to deal with reality, to protect them, to provide for them, to, to, to serve as a power against reality and the power over reality to control reality, you see. We know then that people who generally receive, receive certain levels of education, types of education and so forth, tend to engage in violent behavior less, at least the kind that we're talking about here today. People who have been raised in certain types of family situations tend to produce less violence than others. People who have uh, been uh, socialized in appropriate spiritual institutions tend to be less violent in their orientation than others. People who, uh, whose household and levels of health and so forth exist tend to, to uh, produce less violence than other people, you see. But you have a trick that has gone on in this country. At the same time, we have been attacked uh, in terms of psych uh, psychic violence by those who rule over us, 
those who've slandered our culture and those who've slandered us as people. These same people have also uh, destroyed the social institutions that we could have used to mitigate and reduce the effects of their violence against us as people, you see. So you get a double whammy. It's like when we used to get punished as a kid, somebody get ready to hit you, and you hold up your hand, and they tell you to what? Take your hand down. <laughs> so I can hit you even harder. <laughs> you see? So, you know, so it's not so much sometimes a person is perpetrating violence if you're able to do what? Hold your hand up. Hold something up between yourself and what other people are doing to you. You can provide a defense for yourself. But in this sense, the, the, we have been attacked, and not only are we attacked, the means by which we can defend ourselves against the attack, against our person and against our character and against our psychological well-being and so forth. The means, the income and the other means that we could use to mitigate and to change the nature and the results of those attacks against us have also been removed. So this then creates violence. So when you look in these communities where education has been disinvested, where deindustrialization has taken over, where whole industries have been have moved out of the communities completely, and now they're getting ready to move these industries totally out of the country, ladies and gentlemen. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the effects of deindustrialization. Even those of us who will get jobs and degrees don't have much of a future in America. I'm telling you. If we do not wake up and understand what is going on in this country economically, we are going to be destroyed. We got people out here motivating people. You can be what you want to be, live your dream, all that kind of stuff. That operates on assumptions, ladies and gentlemen. That operates on the assumption of an expanding economy, that there's increasing what? Job opportunities and increasing possibilities. In the 1960s, the United States economy was expanding and it had opportunities. Then we could say, if we would only move, remove racism and job discrimination, we can make it. But that era is over. This was over 30 years ago. In this era now, the removing of racism is not going to enhance the economic possibilities of black people because the jobs are not there. The nature of the economy is changing. Racism is no longer our one and only problem. The global economy is changing in such a way that even if whites remove racism right now, tomorrow, we would still be suffering because the factories are gone. The factories in Detroit that used to provide good livings for black men and women and families that worked in GM and Ford and so forth, that made it possible for them to raise their children, to build decent housing for their children, to send their children to college and everything, are gone. They've disappeared. And this is the kind of world I young to live in. The global nature of this economy is getting ready to even destroy white folk if they're not careful. Let alone what's going to happen uh, to us as people. This 40% of the population growth in the United States is being fueled by immigration. You hear what I'm saying? That means other groups are coming in here piling up on top of black folk by the tons and they're better educated. If you compare, for instance, Koreans and others with blacks, you can see an Asian with, with blacks, 46% of the people got college degrees. And we're talking about black people with about 16 or 13%. What are you talking about? These people, and these, they provide 35% of the people coming into America today. The white man is even hiring people against himself, against his own children. You must understand that today, if you look at the exchange rate between the, uh, Rush, the Russian ruble and United States dollar, it takes almost 600 Russian rubles to equal one United States dollar. What does that mean? That means that the United States can hire now the top physicists and mathematicians in the world for $100 a month. And that's what's happening. That means that they are bringing the Russians over here now. You'll see them in the University of Texas at Austin and other places to teach the physics and the mathematics and so forth. At this point, the unemployment rate for new PhDs, and I'm talking about white folk now, new PhDs in mathematics, chemistry, science, 
Computer science is 13%. And I'm talking about people coming out of MIT, Stanford, and the best white universities because they're being undercut by the importation of Russians and other people right in this school. And we could go into details about this thing. This is what we're facing. So I'll finish the rest of it when we come back. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. I sure, I'm sure that you want to hear the conclusion of this address. Right now we're going to hear... Hotep. Greetings, my brothers and sisters. Hopefully you are enjoying the, the conference. I'd uh, like to speak with you briefly on behalf of the African American Defense Committee Against Police Violence. Uh, several black uh, organizations, community organizations in Chicago are asking for our help. Uh, we have some petitions out on the uh, a registration desk there and what we're asking is that you sign them it's a nationwide uh, petition to bring uh, the federal government to bring criminal charges against seven Chicago police officers who have been found to have tortured at least 50 people uh, who have been in their custody and they have been found to torture these individuals by a in-house police commission but the police commission will not fire any of, the, any of these officers, nor will they bring any criminal charges against them. And that's what the petition drive is for, is to ask the uh, Cook County uh, District Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office in, uh, in the state of Illinois to bring federal and state criminal charges against these seven police officers. And briefly, these are some of the tactics that they're using. Uh, the torture tactics used includes dry submarines, which is placing a plastic bag over an individual's head until near suffocation, Handcuff, handcuffing uh, victims behind their backs and letting them hang from a nail in the wall, placing guns in victims' mouths to play Russian roulette, and using electroshock devices to electrocute victims on their ears hands, and genitals. These acts of torture violate international human rights laws, federal civil rights laws, and criminal laws. So again, uh, please, after the lecture, if you'll uh, will, uh, help us by signing our petition, and uh, you don't have to you know, be a resident of... Without further ado, we want to bring Dr. Amos Wilson back. I hope that you're taking notes and that you will be formulating some questions which you can uh, ask Dr. Wilson when we get into our discussion phase. Dr. Wilson. Thank you again. So, uh, we will go into a second phase here, which will focus more on uh, solutions and prescriptions. Of course, I must begin by stating that I certainly have no monopoly on solutions. <clears throat> solutions are things, of course, that we have to arrive at as a community and arrive at in community. But uh, uh, what I'll point out is some general trends, I think, that may be important to us resolving uh, some of the issues. Number one, though, I want to point out the fact that we should be very concerned about methodology of support. I know it sounds somewhat academic uh, to say that, but I think it's very important that not only we ask questions, but we ask the right kinds of questions and we ask what we call meaningful 
questions. You see, you want to ask questions that in an attempt to arrive at the answer or in arriving at the answer, you have a programmable answer, an answer that involves, uh, that implies uh, some group of activities or practical approaches for solving the problem. When you look at explanations of problems, try to approach the explanations in such a way that um, when you've completed them, there is a programmatic uh, intent or possibility contained in the explanation. For I'll give an example of kind of what I'm talking about, for instance, there are any number of explanations as to why we are into what we are into as people. Uh, but then sometimes you wonder about the efficacy of the implied solution in the explanation. For instance, some people would argue that uh, we're in the condition we're in because white folk hate us, you know, and uh, they don't like us, uh, this or that, or they uh, misperceive who we are. Uh, while I don't argue against that, and I think that explanation certainly has some validity, you're going to have to ask the question, what kind of program is contained in that sort of explanation, you see? Uh, logically, it implies then that if we want to change our situation, we must convince white folk to love us. And, and that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> you see, and, and so you know, say, well, all this comes from white folk hating us implies that we can get them to stop hating us, then everything's going to be all right. But then you have to ask the question: you know, What if they never stop? You know, what? Where are we going to be? You know, what? What can we do with that? And we see some of this on TV. We get the hate busters campaign. You know, let's stop the hate. You know, as if that's going to uh, really resolve some problems. Uh, we set out on a missionary mission to uh, convert them to their own religion, you know, or what have you. And we, we go through through that one. Very difficult procedures, and while this is going on, the race is often perishing and falling apart, and matters are getting worse. It may take us another 25, 30, or a century or two to bring these people around. There's a belief that uh, they misperceive who we are. You know, they, they see us as stereotypes, and if they really knew that we were the great Africans and the great Egyptians, and if they really knew all the great contributions we made to America, the whole debt, then they would change the attitude. Uh, I wouldn't wait on that one too much either. <laughs> You know, the idea that people are oppress other people out of ignorance of who they are is very questionable, you see. Much of the information we get about who we are, of course, has gotten from white folk, what can I tell you? So the idea that they don't know who we are and uh, what we are is, is a little questionable in the first place. <laughs> and uh, I think also the fruits of domination, why do people dominate other people? Because it benefits them, you know? That's the point. There's benefit in it. Not just because they love hating. There's money in it. There's power in it. There's control, security in it. There's a lot of stuff in, in dominating other people, you see. And uh, one of these days they're going to say, oh yeah, you were, you were the great Egyptians and uh, you know, you contributed a lot and you built this country, so what? You know, what does that mean? I got to give up my money? <laughs> I got to give up the privileges that dominating you have given to me. No, I like living this, this good life too well to give it up. You know, in other words, often the benefits that people derive from domination justify the domination itself. You know, why do you dominate me? It's good for me. What can I tell you? <laughs> I make money. I live well. You know, and uh, so the idea then that... Uh, we're going to teach these people history and convince them of our humanity and of our greatness and all of that, I think, too, is a questionable program. We've been trying that one for a long time. And here you are now, struggling with the curriculum of inclusion and multicultural curriculum and all that kind of stuff. And you see, again, the denial is still there. 
And every time you push some kind of positive idea forward, it's scuttled or distorted in some form, in some way or another. So again, I mean, you can do explanations, you know, about ice people and sun people and the fact that these people came out of that cold climate and maybe that's why they're so cold and unfeeling. I have no problem with that as explanation. But what are we going to do? Thaw them out? You know, heat them up? I don't know. You know, what's, what solution is in there? See, I'm not arguing with the explanation. I want you to understand that. You see, but I'm talking about what program is complained is contained in the explanation. And so often you, you, before you get caught up in the discussions of racism and this thing and that thing, you want to look at the question itself and look at whether they're answering the question and developing the question has in it a possibility of a practical program uh, as such. You know, it's, it's all right to talk about uh, the white man protecting his genes. Perhaps he is. Certainly he's a minority in the world. And uh, perhaps if he jumped into race mixing, he would disappear as an identifiable uh, ethnic group and stuff like that. And maybe uh, white men do have penis envy of black men, you know. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Shrink it? <laughs> uh, you know, to, is he going to change his mind as a result of that? Uh, undergo some kind of gene splicing operation in order to resolve the problem? <laughs> These are, uh, so, you know, sometimes we can get caught up in answers and, and explanations that are exotic and they're really, they, they certainly are valid in many instances, but often sometimes they are not exactly practical in terms of their programmatic intent. And this is the kind of thing that we have to look at. Uh, part of my approach, the reason why I'm writing the book on power then is that I sort of reached a simplistic um, uh, approach to this problem that says white folk do to us what they do to us because they can do it. <laughs> you know? And frankly, I don't give a hoot what their motivations for doing it are. To tell you the truth, I don't care whether they come from the ice or the snow or, or they have gene problems or other kind of problems. I'm not going to take their oppression regardless of their reason. There's no reason for black people to uh, to uh, take the oppression of white folk, you know? It doesn't matter what it is. And so in the end, the their capacity to oppress us, as far as I'm concerned, boils down to the fact that they have the power to do so. And if we want to end their oppression, we must end their power to oppress us. And so the goal becomes one of equaling their power, neutralizing their power, or overwhelming their power, you see, and blocking their capacity to oppress us regardless of how they feel about us, you see, regardless of what their motives are. And that's why then I started focusing in on the issue of power. By what means can we gather enough power to block these people's uh, ability to oppress us and do what they will with us. What kind of power do we have available to us as people? What kind of potential do we have available to us that we can bring this change about in the world? And we must go for, for power as a means of protecting our interests as people, you see. We have to study power. How is it developed? How is it applied? And we learn that power is not contained in the people. They, these people don't have power because they are white folk. Power is not inherent in, in a race as a biological fact. You see, uh, these people have not always had power. Their domination uh, at this point really has been very brief. When you compare the, their history, you talk about what, about a 500 year scope, not, not much more. 
even though many of us who don't read history, you see, we fall for the idea that white folk have always run the world. And they always will. I mean, it's such, such a joke. White folk have not always run anything. You know. These people just came up into their ascendants. What, starting in the 15th century, more or less? Yeah. So we're not talking about people who've always run something and always will. No, no. Power essentially is built around strategy and technique. How people align themselves with each other. It is centered around organization, you see, and systems, not in people, not in individuals, but alignments, systematic relationships, tactics, strategies. This is where power comes from. And so we need to dissociate, you see, power and, 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 and whiteness and power and race. Mm -mm. And you can see it in your own history. Just the issue of alignment is an interesting one. The fact that in Montgomery, Alabama, all the folk decided that they would walk. That's a different alignment, isn't it? That was a different alignment of people from all sitting in the back of the bus. That alignment changed the power relations right there. The fact that people walk together shoulder to shoulder, you see, and march is an alignment of people. And that alignment itself, just people lining up like that, changed the nature of power relations in the South. The fact that people sat by each other side by side at a lunch counter, you see, or placed themselves in a particular position. What is this? Strategy, tactic, you see? And that changed what? Power relations. The fact that people refuse to buy something, you see, to participate in a particular way, brought about what? Power. See, so it's not inherent in skin, it's inherent in organization. It's inherent in, in, in pattern and in ways of relating, you see. So the powerlessness of our people to a great extent is not gone, it's just not being used. We used it when we wanted to assimilate, you see, and then we, we, we gave it up once we got a little bit. <laughs> you see, but uh, now we don't want to use it again. We can use those same methods, techniques, plus new ones to achieve new goals and new things if we want to. But you got to study power. You see, that's a whole field in the social sciences that deals but nothing but power. The people that rule us just don't rule coincidentally. They are students of power. When they major in government and so forth, they're studying power and the use of power. Machiavelli wrote about power. And how does a prince rule and what's necessary for ruling people, you see? And you got to understand then, if you're going to change the power relations, then you've got to understand the tactics of power and, and, and use them to protect yourself against others. As I said earlier, power is about living. Powerlessness, weakness leaves one vulnerable to being preyed upon and ultimately killed and destroyed. And even a plant has to have power to drill its roots into the soil, something like that. And so we must get away from the idea of power as some kind of uh, foreign thing for us uh, as people. A great deal of power, uh, a, a great uh, idea that's important to power is intentionality. You've got to intend to get it, to really have it, you see. You've got to have some kind of goals that you're shooting for. 
the intentionality because intentionality organizes your resources and your forces and it systematizes the the potentials that you have so that they collectively contribute to achieving the goal but if you don't have an idea of where you want to go and 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 so forth it's difficult to have power you see that's why we talk about nation building if you intend to build a nation that intentionality organizes everything else once you make up your mind that you're going to build a nation once you make up your mind that you're going to build an African global economic system then how you educate your children how you socialize uh, children how you you're going to relate to each other in terms of individuals the kind of institutions that you must develop the kind of organization of money and all of that becomes organized under the influence of the goal of the intentionality you say to a good extent we have been weakened by uh, disempowering intentionalities and there are two major ones that I talk about what well, and I call them fantasies really that black people operate under the influence of what I call a collective fantasy yes groups can have fantasies just as well as individuals and fantasies are not the, just the thing of children they they are part of our adult life as people many of us are still trying to fulfill fantasies that were generated in early childhood you no know, we're looking for that perfect love or that this or that that you know and uh and every time we meet someone we're trying to bring them into our fantasy and you know fit them into our you know our concept of perfection and often it doesn't work out and we try 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 again and often we don't question the conscious and the unconscious fantasies that have control of us and that create a lot of the problems that we have we don't question their reality a great to a great extent it is understandable that many of us who have suffered from the psychic violence that I talked about earlier where people who have, have attacked our very biological characteristics and it's interesting sometimes how in our phrases our psychology is revealed you hear many of us say well they did this to me because I'm black are they doing this because we are black is that really why the person is, is abusing you because you're black or is it that they're abusing you because they are pathological or crazy you see that's why often we suffer the kind of abuse we do and suffer the way we do and indirectly blame ourselves for our own suffering and blame our color for the craziness and madness of other people and we can hold then the people who abuse us, lynch us, beat us, do all the kind of things we complain about every day. We can hold them up as paragons of normality and as ideals that we want our children to be just like. Of the people we want to live with and think like and be like. And forget about their whole history and the relationship of their history with us. And just turn in a simple phrase that we well, yeah, we want to be just like them. We don't want to be no different. And of course, you can see the more you get just like them, the more you abuse yourself. If they abuse you, if the more you like them, the more you're going to abuse yourself. <laughs> yeah, you know, the black on black violence. I talk about that as what identification with the aggressor. See the aggressor and he, when he gets through kicking you and knocking you around, tells you, you know, I'm doing this because you're different from me. And so you get a lie that just says, if I were just like him and if he if he if he and I were one, then I wouldn't suffer the way I do. But yet his system, his privileges and his power is built on our suffering. It's built on our domination. You see? 
if, if his power and privilege comes from abusing us, then for us to become one with him, we'd have to engage in what? Self-abuse. Yeah. And become a part of his system allied against ourselves as people. This is why we talked about Colin Powell. Like, oh, he's a part of the United States Army. He's leading the United States Army. He's got power. You're, you're out of your mind. He doesn't have any power. He's still a servant. Read your history. There have been slave armies, whole armies of slaves who fought for their masters against even their own ethnic groups. Read Chester William, Arabized Africans, under the influence of a philosophy where they even attack their own genetic brothers and sisters. You see, not as an army of free men, but as slaves. There have been slave generals, generals who've led full armies, who themselves were slaves. So the idea then that you may have a man that's leading an army and heading all the United States armed forces, that that represents some kind of freedom and power is, is a badly, you're badly mistaken. And he becomes the head of this just at the point where the United States is developing a policy called, uh, you know, a policy now that tries to get them to deal with North-South conflicts. And what are those conflicts? The conflicts between essentially European nations and non-European nations. And he has to lay out the strategies. How are we going to deal with these third world insurrections and all of this stuff in the future as if he's not a part of that? Now that I bring that up, I just want to mention one quick thing here. I have a very interesting thing that was published back in March, 19, March 8, 1992, in the uh, New York Times. And it created a little stir, and then it quickly disappeared because it was so blatant. The, the article is titled, uh, U.S. Strategy Plan Calls for Ensuring No Rivals Develop. <laughs> That's the new world order. You think you're going to just, you know, get yourself equal to these white folks. you got another thought coming. You're going to have to struggle for it. You're going to have to fight it. Fight for it. It's subtitled One Superpower World. A one superpower world. We intend to be the only superpower in the world and we're going to let a Negro write about how we can do it. Even though, and you know, lay out the plan and go through the whole study to show how we can dominate other people of his ethnic group. Pent in the next item says, Pentagon's document outlined ways to thwart challenges to primacy of America. It's a long piece, I can't go through it all. I just give you a little idea of what some of it says here. <laughs> in a broad new policy statement that in its final draft that is in its final drafting stage, the Defense Department asserts that America's political and military mission in the post-war era will be to ensure no rival superpower is allowed to emerge in Western Europe, not even the cousins, <laughs> Asia, or the territories of the former Soviet Union. This, people think out loud about power. This is no coincidental game. And it's in a 46-page document that has been circulating in the highest levels of the Pentagon for weeks. Okay, so you can be sure our buddy Mr. Powell was reading them and probably part of it. And which Defense Secretary Dick Cheney expects to release later this month states that part of the American mission will be convincing potential competitors that they need not aspire to a greater role or pursue a more aggressive posture in, uh, to protect their legitimate interest. Okay? All right? 
it was so stark until some of the people, you know, said, hey, you gotta tone this down. You can't let everybody know what the deal is here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the policy of deterrence. The classified document makes the case for a world dominated by one superpower whose position can be perpetuated by constructive behavior and sufficient military might to deter any nation or group of nations from challenging American primacy. Okay? It's in your face. That's why I don't want you to read, you understand? This is why black children are not taught to read. If black people really learned to read and were passionate about reading and were caught up in reading and understanding words and so forth, you would have censorship in this country. You see? But we can brag about freedom of speech and the press and the whole thing as long as you can keep people's interest in reading at a very low level. <laughs> you see? And that's what it's about. You know the old phrase, if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in writing. <laughs> yeah, put it right in your face. Right in your face. I mean, that shows the level and depth of mind creation which has occurred over these centuries in terms of our people. To perpetuate this role, the United States must sufficiently account for the interests of the advanced industrial nations to discourage them from challenging our leadership or seeking to overturn the established political and economic order, the document state. With this focus on this concept of benevolent domination, <laughs> by yes, by one power, the Pentagon document articulates the clearest rejection to date of collective internationalism. You know, this great brotherhood they were singing about in the 60s. The strategy that emerged from World War II when the five victorious powers sought to form uh, a United Nations that could mediate disputes and police outbreaks of violence. And it, it goes on, uh, if you get a chance, to really read how nations and people think. You know, just, just take, a, take a gander at it. I mean, some of the statements are, are amazing. Uh, one down here, I believe, says, this is a dominant consideration underlying the new regional defense strategy and requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. Okay? These people never intend to turn you loose. Yeah. If you're sitting around here waiting for some glory day, when, uh, you know, the little black boys and little white girls and all that other stuff going to hold in. You're going to wait forever. That ain't the way it works. That's not the way it works in the real world. There's some people here, black people, who, who've uh, inculcated, internalized the American idea of progress, that things must get better over time. Who told you that lie? You know? Nations regress in history as well as progress in history. Look at the history, it's, it's right there before your face. Ethnic groups have, been, have disappeared. Ethnic groups have been destroyed. Even species of animals do what? Disappear. Where is it written in concrete then that you're here forever? Huh? That you necessarily got to be what? Better off tomorrow than you are today. See, many of us have bought that idea. Oh, well, we were in slavery two, 200 years ago. Look at where we are now. So that means, you know, 100 years from now, we're just going to really be in heaven. Well, forget <laughs> Shoot. Nobody guarantees you that. That's not written in concrete anywhere. And so many of us have given up, see, the development of power, development of self-sufficiency, and the other kind of things because we just sort of expect this automatic progress to occur. You see? that uh, it's just going to automatically get better. Uh-uh. It could get worse. It could go the other way. And if you read the signs correctly today, it's going the other way for African people. 
Yes. I was telling you earlier about the, the economic change that's going on in this country. And I detail that in the book on power I, I, to try to get across to our people the tremendous structural changes going on in the United States economic system. And the fact that this country, the idea that whites will be on top is being severely challenged right at this moment by the Asians. And chances are within the next century, it will not be the whites and Europeans who are the global powers, in particular the global economic powers. It could be the Asians. And I'm going to tell you something, the Asians are not going to treat you any better than the whites are treat you. And chances are they're going to treat you worse. Don't be deceived by this people of color bit. You know, that's some of us think, you know, he thinks better than white folk. <laughs> you know, so they're people of color. So, you know, they're going to give us a break. You better watch out. It's not necessarily the case. As I told you earlier, jobs are being shipped out of this country. Racism. The United States is no longer the power it used to be. In the, the power of the presidency is not what it used to be. The United States is not in the position to dictate uh, economic policy across the world anymore. The United States itself must respond to global economic changes. That's why I'm saying again that racism is not necessarily on the top of the list now in terms of, of what is, is bringing about changes in the black community. A, a, a lot of what is happening in the black community is the result of global economic changes working their effects into the community itself. And that's why now we have to move beyond racism in our thought pattern to, to move into the area of economic thinking and global thinking. If we're going to survive as a people, we got to look at what's going on. The United, chances are the United States will not be able to supply the jobs and the other kind of things that we see as necessary for ourselves as people to survive. It's, it's having a hell of enough time doing it even for white folk, you see. And, uh, we must be aware of this and change our thoughts. I think what we've been misled by the fantasy. And as I was saying earlier, I can understand people who've been injured. You see, fantasy is what I call compensatory fantasies. As implied by the word compensatory, means that the person often um, engages in wishful thinking to compensate for uh, a, a painful reality. You see, they wish things were different than what they are. And they get caught up in dreams and messianic hopes and things like this in, uh, in order to deal with uh, their current pains and their past pains and to soothe themselves and to alleviate uh, the pain. So it's somewhat understandable that a, a sizable group among us looking at the psychic pain of oppression looking at our suffering at the hands of whites, believe that our solution would be one that involves merging with them, becoming one with them, convincing them that we are not black, even when they're looking directly at us, so that they would see us only as some kind of abstraction, as a man, as a human being, you know, so that, you know, our, our pure biological state would uh, be looked through. And the logic is clear, you know, the idea then if we can convince them that we are no different from them in any sort of way, then their uh, uh, violation of us based on difference would disappear. And so it's no wonder many of us got psychologically caught up in the fantasy of the great merger. And you can tell when you have a, a fantasy, a collective fantasy, by the way people respond to certain types of leaders. You see, when, Mark, when uh, Martin Luther King came out with that fantasy of brotherhood and all of us holding hands and all this kind of stuff, you could see the black community emotionally attaching itself to that concept because he articulated a lot of our own personal fantasies and articulated the way out of our pain. And so 
you had then that was a part of his charisma 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 must meet itself halfway the person has charisma not only because they have a great oratorical style and so forth but because often they articulate what the masses and other people also wish to uh, have articulated in themselves and we responded to that with great hope and now some 30 years later we look at the situation and what are we talking about? Black on black violence, unemployment, hyper segregated inner cities, drugs, miseducation, you know, one thing at another. What, what happened to that glorious solution? So some of us now are trying to change fantasies a little bit. And they're good fantasies too. There's some fantasies that work for you. That's why I think there, there's an increased interest in Malcolm X. You see, trying to now maybe check it out. I think we are becoming a little sober now, and I think we're kind of facing the fact that chances are we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna make this merger. So some of us now have fallen for the fantasy of multiculturalism. Yeah, you know, another joke. Of a, uh, a garden variety of assimilationism. Well, we 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 not going to give up our blackness and our Africanness, but we're going to have this great moment when all of these little groups, black and Chinese and yik yik and this and that, you know, we're going to all respect each other's rights and each other's culture, and we're going to dance each other's little dances, and you know, and uh, we're going to talk about how we all contributed to America, you know, and ain't that going to be sweet? Another dream. <laughs> Another dream, man. And then I see black people pushing this more than anyone else. And I ask all the time, where is this multiculturalism you are talking about? Why are black people being taught multiculturalism when they try to be every culture around? <laughs> if someone says, oh, you look Mexican. Oh! <laughs> Oh, you look Indian. You know, we, we've been into multiculturalism hard, man. We never lynched any cultural people. Other people from other cultures have come to what? Live among us, marry among us, go into business among us, the whole bit. We don't have a record of every anti-culturalism. So why is it we are being taught that, huh? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Do you know they're on the culture that black folk have rejected wholesale? African culture. That's right. You know it. Don't call I ain't no African. Don't call me an African. You know? No, you know what? It's the only one you've rejected outright, totally. But you're ready to do it. We eat everybody's food. We, you know, we do the whole number. We buy from everybody. We do the whole number. Then they're going to tell you what you need now is more multiculturalism. It's a joke. It's a joke. And how's somebody going to respect your culture when they see you down in the dirt? How are you going to say your culture is the equal of other cultures and should be respected for other cultures? And then they look at what's happening to you and they're going to ask you, well, if your culture is that great, why are you where you are? You see, you don't, you know, this little intellectual game about uh, having respect for other people's cultures, forget it. We talk about inclusion. Inclusion into what? Some sick system? Why should I have an equal respect for European culture by which I have been victimized? How is that culture equally respectable to my own? You understand? Yeah. You got to think. When we talk about African people and African culture and talk about a curriculum of inclusion, Black people and African people are not suffering merely from the fact that their, our culture has been ignored and not taught in school. 
not the way some other cultures have. Okay, the Chinese culture might not have been taught in public school, but the Chinese were still, still speaking Chinese, still eating Chinese food, still got Chinatown. They have a continuous what? History and culture. It has not been broken. Okay? And you can name many of the others. The culture still goes on. The history is still there. The whole thing is still there. But then you look at African culture. We're talking about a culture that has been what? Chopped up and made discontinuous and destroyed, you understand, to a great extent. We are talking about the reconstruction of a culture, not just the inclusion of a culture that has been ignored, but the actual, recon we are in the process of reconstructing an African culture. And therefore, the little inclusion is, is not going to be sufficient for what we are about as people. We are talking about trying to heal the wounds that have been perpetrated on us as people. So the education, our education is not just a process of talking about African history and doing African dance and talking about how we contributed. We are talking about trying to heal ourselves as people. We are in, involved in a therapeutic engagement, not a mere uh, trotting out of little cultural uh, doodads. You understand what I'm saying? We're in the process of liberating ourselves. So there's no little inclusion that's going to meet that kind of need, ladies and gentlemen. No little multicultural program is going to suit that for what we, what we are about. We are rediscovering who we are, what we are. And we have to create even new possibilities for ourselves. Then you ask the next question. What economic program does multiculturalism solve? What kind of economic program is in there in multiculturalism for African people? What political program is there for African people in multiculturalism? What social program is there in multiculturalism for African people? Where does it speak about black on black violence in multiculturalism? Where does it speak about the, the educational problem in multiculturalism? But does it speak about the fact that African people the world over are suffering economically and politically all over? Where does multiculturalism resolve problems confronting African people? Where are the multicultural partnerships, black folk? Where are the black people and the Korean people in business together, multiculturally? and Koreas living in harmony and multicultural peace next door to each other and contributing to each other's education and recreational centers and other kind of things. Where are they? Where is the black and Arab multicultural partnership? Is it in Africa? Is it in Detroit? Is it in America? Where is this multiculturalism you're talking about? Where's the multicultural partnerships of black folk and white folk owning corporations and other things in America? Black folk and Jews, where is it? It's nowhere but in your head is a fantasy. <laughs> That's all it is. And while you are fantasizing about this multicultural joke, you see, people sell black people social progress, not economic progress, you see. Not progress in terms of power and stuff like that, social progress. And they say you etiquette. Well, we ain't going to call you by that word anymore. <laughs> you see, we'll act nice towards you. We'll be sweet, but we're still going to keep the goodies. We're still on all the businesses, all the corporations. We'll still have economic and political control, but we'll be nicer to you. Yeah. You know, sound like a virgin, you know. Be tender. <laughs> That's all we want. Just be tender. Do whatever you want to with me. Just be tender. Come on. Be gentle. Be gentle. <laughs> yeah, we don't care. I, I, I talk. I did a long piece on the Koreans in New York City, and now they've even carved out a whole town in L.A. called Koreatown, owning over ten thousand businesses 
in L.A. Right in the middle of Negroes. You understand? They named their own town. I, you know, the multicultural Korean town. Is that what it's called? <laughs> I talked about Korean associations and wrote about them here last week as I was writing this book on power. The Korean American Producers Association. Not the multicultural black and white together uh, producer association. Korean American uh, what Producers Association. Korean American Grocers Association. Okay? Korean Centers for Small Business, okay? The Korean American Association of Greater New York. I don't see multiculturalism contained anywhere in it. And they're just running a joke on black folk, a plain joke. I don't have time to detail all the joke, man. It's an amazing situation. And I keep telling you, you sent your sons over there in the 1950s, and they died in South Korea. They shed their blood in South Korea. When the Korean could have enjoyed the privileges at that point, that black people could not even enjoy. And you're right over there now, protecting them against the North Koreans and the Chinese. In fact, I tell people, you know, if you want to get something out of the United States, kick their ass first, and then you get all you want to out of it. Why am I saying that? You look at who the United States aids. Japan, black people dying in that war. Rebuilding Japan, protecting Japan. Send black people over there to fight the Japanese. Then you send you over here to fight the Koreans and then fight the Chinese. And what happens? After you get through fighting, they take your tax money, build an infrastructure, build a stable government so that white boys can have a place safe for their own investment and protect it with U.S. money and money from the U.S. Treasury. This is what you get, you see. That's why I don't care for contributionism, you see. So you like that and whatever. So the Koreans end up getting the money. And now this country is courting whom? The Chinese fought them over itself. The Chinese fought them. The Japanese fought them. Then we have the Marshall Plan, right? The Germans fought them. 300,000 black men fought in that war over there in Europe. And what does the United States, after you fight, they hang a few of you and do the whole thing. You can read the history. And then take the money again and build up Germany and build up the country. Even this foreign competition that we talk about that's devastating our employment opportunities and devastating the United States has been essentially financed by the United States itself. Yes. When you look at what we call direct foreign investments, the investment in foreign countries by U.S. corporations and so forth, you will see that within the last, what, since about 85, the United States has invested something like $450 billion in other countries. Okay? And in one year, it may invest something like $150-some billion, most of which goes to Europe and Africa gets $3 billion. Okay? Africa gets 0.4% of the U.S.'s investment across the country. Africa has never fought this country. Blacks have never fought this country, but the people who fight it get the box. So you better get hip. <laughs> okay? And now we fight and die and give up our treasury and all of this kind of stuff, and we get a group of people then who come back over here with this and become a part of the system. And they should have been bringing us gifts and thoughts for the sacrifice we made in their interest, what do we get for it? And we got some Negroes here who think they owe these people a living. You understand? I'm telling you. And they come in here, and, I, and believe me, I'm not resenting the Koreans. I am really talking about us. Because they're doing by themselves what any race should do by itself. Feed its children. See to its own security first. I'm not asking them to give up their uh, fighting for their own interests and their children. That's not my point. I'm talking about why we sit here and support this 
And this contributes directly to violence in our community. We are keeping Korean youngsters out of crime. We are subsidizing their reduced criminality while our own go unfed, un 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 unemployed, and the whole bit because we're so busy giving money away to other groups. And then we wonder why our own children attack us in the streets. Yes, so we think that we can give away their economic inheritance and their heritage and then they're supposed to treat us with respect. It ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen. So you give good housing to other ethnic groups and see that they're fed well and see that they live outside of the inner city and the whole thing, but they can come in and take all of your billions every day. And then some of you are so moral. You try to say, I don't see color. <laughs> Which means you can't see your own color children in the condition that they're in. And you can't see how you contributed to them. You don't see color. So you just shop where you get the best bargain. You even feel morally superior when you spend money with the other folk. You think when somebody asks you to buy black, they're asking you to do something that's sinful. Yes, you do. Yeah, you don't see color. But you see, poverty is not randomly distributed across people. No, that would be something else if poverty was, you know, everybody were equally poor and so forth. Then yeah, okay, just spend your money wherever. But that's not the case. And so we don't spend our money in terms of the way it can best help those most in need, which happen to be our children. And because in our twisted moral sense, which is what happens when you take a religion and you don't look at it carefully, hand it to you by your oppressor, by the way, and you don't restructure it for your own interest. You understand? We're not only here to serve God, but God also serves us, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? And God himself said, there's a way you pray, right, to get results. You just can't pray anyway, can you? And it also says what? You have to relate to God in a particular sort of way to get blessings. All right? So that means that there's some kind of contractual relationship that occurs there, you see? And so you got a question then, when you keep getting the bad end of the stick, you got to say, well, hey, am I praying right? Am I relating right? Am I looking at this thing right? What's going on here? You know? But we don't stop to do that. So in our very moral uh, situation, we subsidize sin and violence. Because we don't look at the way we spend our money, with whom we spend our money, and we help to maintain racial and ethnic inequality and maintain our children in unemployment, in poor educational circumstances, and other circumstances. So while we are feeling morally pure, we are creating immorality and sin and destruction within our own breasts as people. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yes. We'll talk about that more in, in the book of power. Well, let's see, what, what, when did we start? 8.15? <laughs> Sometimes I forget the original study. But uh, we got to look at it. A lot of it has to do with these fantasies that we are fed. So we are fed to multiculturalism as, as idea and some kind of spirit, but the other people are operating based on their ethnicity. Yes, they're, they're operating on their ethnicity. The Koreans are operating on the basis of a consciousness and an identity of being Korean. And they use that consciousness and identity to advance their economic interests. And now they're going to use their, their economic interests to advance their political interests in this country. The Chinese are doing exactly the same thing moving rapidly ahead in the world's economic system. Based on what? Their Chinese-ness. Not their multiculturalness, but their Chinese-ness. The white man has a global economic system because white men live all over the globe and trade it with each other all over the globe. 
And therefore, through a communications network, trading network, and so forth, they were able to come to dominate. But they did it in terms of what? Their whiteness. You understand what I'm telling you? An economic system is not a system of money. It is first and foremost a social system, a system of social relations. An economic ex system existed prior to money. Economics comes out of the way people choose to relate to each other. And if they relate to each other in a particular sort of way, they can develop economic power and so forth. We have plenty of money as African people. But the nature of the way we relate to each other socially does not allow us to use the power that is in that money. And see, multiculturalism is going to blind you to this, these power possibilities and these fantasies. So I'll wrap it up here, and, uh, and we'll throw it open uh, to the floor. I just want to remember one thing here. The, if you want to understand a lot of what's going on and a lot of the violence that's going on, you can look at what's happened in this community as you would look at uh, what happened to China during the Opium Wars. And it pays you to study that. And remember that uh, at first the British got hooked to tea. They became addicted to tea, but the British are growing the tea, you know, <laughs> right? Tea was growing in China. And the Chinese says, you can have all the tea you want to, you got to pay us in silver and gold. Interestingly enough, though, the British didn't have anything the Chinese wanted, <laughs> you know? They saw their products and what they were doing as superior to what the uh, British were, were manufacturing. So you got a trade imbalance going there, right? The British gold and silver was flowing out at a tremendous rate, and had it kept doing so, the uh, British would have suffered social disorganization. Because, you know, it takes money to maintain institutions. It takes money to maintain governance. It takes money to create jobs and other things and to maintain the population at peace and harmony with itself. And when your money is flowing out of your country and being sucked out, then your social institutions, those institutions that maintain harmony and peace and law and order and education and all that stuff begin to collapse. And respect for government and authority and all that stuff also begins to collapse because the government shows itself to be ineffective. So the society begins to what? Become disorganized and you will have then violence and other kind of criminality and things occurring. So the British recognized that they couldn't keep this flow of money out just like the United States is recognizing it as well. It's telling the Japanese, hey, you can, we can't keep this trade imbalance the way you got it. If all our money keeps flowing out, we cannot meet the social needs of our people. We cannot provide them with health care. We cannot provide them with the other kind of things that they need. And at some point, they will begin to rebel, and there will be disorder in the society, you see. This is the value of using the concept of a nation within a nation when you think about us as a people. You must think of yourself as a nation within a nation. And if you think of yourself as that, you can see the root of much of why we're suffering the way we are as a people. We are locked into these inner cities. We are segregated and, and shut out from the American economy and so forth. We are virtually a nation within a nation. But we still operate on the basis of individualism and stuff which does not allow us to see the resolution to our problem. So this situation got so bad until the British said, look, the Chinese are taking all our money. We are not getting money back from them. What's the best way we can do them? They literally then hooked the Chinese to an opium habit. The British had control of the opium fields in India and Burma and so forth. And so they started selling opium to the Chinese. And, the, and then, of course, the shoot got on the other foot. Says, okay, you want the opium and the stuff like that? You want to stay high? Pay silver and gold. <laughs> and then the money started doing what? Flowing back the other way. Britain got rich. The Queen got rich. The United States made a whole lot of money, too, by the way. People don't have the knowledge of that history of how much money was earned by the United States clipper ships and so forth running opium. Because nobody wants to tell you that story, you see. It's all the, the tea party. You better, <laughs> come on, you know, wake up. Man, you not only got to look at real African history, you got to look at real European history. Okay? And so the Chinese now had the problem. 
Well, we, we got a drug problem. Our government is running out of money. We're going to have a problem with what? Social disorganization, the whole bit now. And they told the British, look, you got to stop selling drugs. We're going to block you out. And the British went to war to force them to what? Continue to take drugs. They had two wars and even ended up with chunks of Chinese territory. You understand? They forced them to buy drugs. So forth. What? Now, what am I saying here then again? When you look at the black American community, the African American community as a nation within a nation, you see a very similar thing that's happening. As a nation, all of your wealth is being sucked out of your communities. You got aliens in your midst carrying out billions every day. You got whites carrying out what? Billions every day. I told you earlier that your industries and the jobs you used to have are what? Being taken out every day. And now the drug people come in, and that's an industry, and, and pull all what? The rest of it out. You understand? Therefore, you have no money to maintain your social institutions. You can't build schools for your children and give them the kind of education they need to get. You can't build recreational centers. You can't build businesses so you can employ them. You see, therefore, they don't respect you. You have no authority in your community because you, you have no basis for authority. So the black community then is sinking of its own weight into social disorganization and political disorganization and violence as a result of the fact that we have a major deficit crisis in the African American community. And what then is the overall solution in this sense? You've got to pull in what? Money where? Back. You've got to earn hard currency where? From the outside to what? To bring it back in. You see, when you go out there and bring that money in to your nation and your people, you can build your schools, you can build your institution, you can employ yourself, you can employ your people. Not only that, you can use your money now to come to own some of the territory, even of the other people, to invest in their corporations and come to own their corporations and come to own uh, major pieces of their real estate so that you can now spread your people on into the larger economy. But you're not going to stop there. As you build and money and bring that money into yourself and create wealth in terms of your own nation and your people and earn wealth from investing in the larger economy, you're going to enter into international trade. And you're going to build an African, a pan-African global economic system so that you will be trading across the ocean and the seas, so that your youngsters will be employed consulting and selling and trading across the whole world and building jobs and things for themselves. And you will see crime and violence and the other things begin to disappear, be reduced in our country community. You see. But you got to think. We'll open it up to question here, and maybe during one of the questions, I'll talk about the effect of law, how the law itself generates black violence as well. You got to examine that, you know. Black people have this sacred thing about law. <laughs> you know, we think law is going to protect us. That's what is the law. <laughs> We got the civil rights laws and the equal opportunity. You're out of your mind if you think these laws are going to protect your interests. You're crazy. I just have to tell you that. Laws don't protect anybody. They're just words written on paper. And they're only as strong as the people who enforce them. And once the people who enforce them stop enforcing them, you can forget it. And you have this knowledge in your own history. You used to vote back in the, what, 1870s and so forth. And what happened when the people decided, uh, in order for Rutherby Hayes and other people to get in the office, they were going to give you back to the white folk down south and let them have you? The vote disappeared. Other things disappeared. We should tell us right away here that there is no security in white folks' laws. You got to have real power to protect yourself and your interests. You see, and we don't. And and, and you must understand laws. What are laws? Laws are rules imposed by one group against another in their interest as a group. There's nothing sacred about it. Those who have power and the ability to impose their power on others will make rules and impose their rules, call them laws. 
try to make you think they're sacred and all that kind of stuff. Just so, so that they can appear to be legitimate in their domination. But in the end, when their interests change, they will change the laws. Or forget about the laws, you see. But to a great extent, it's the very laws that generate criminality. Quick example. At one t for centuries, the peasants in Europe had the right to, to, to uh, collect wood and stuff from their lords, uh, you know, from the land. They had what we call common property. So during the winter, when the crops were laid by and so forth, they could hunt, they could, you know, and later on in the uh, summer or something, they could fish, they could find their firewood, they could, do, they could graze their cattle and all of this in the common land. This went on for centuries until it was a virtual right, until at some point wool became a very lucrative uh, crop. And those people in control of the society and who had power decided then that they wanted to raise sheep so that they could sell the wool and make a whole lot of money. They threw the people right out into the streets. Right out. And enclosed the land. And suddenly all the rights they had were now denied. And if they tried to exercise the same right that they exercised just the day before, they could be labeled what? Criminal. Was it because they had a criminal personality? Because they had criminal genes? No, it was because of what? The law had changed. And it says, this behavior was all right yesterday, but today it's what? Criminal behavior. So this is why you got to be careful when people start looking for that criminal personality, you know, and all that. You got to look at the law first. What is the law? How does the law? It, it, the law defines crime. They were more, made to be beggars. And you know what? Those people then made a law against begging. If you're a beggar, you're a criminal. That's against the law to beg. Okay, now you've thrown me into the street, and now you make it against the law for me to beg. And now I guess we're talking about what kind of personality do, do beggars have? What kind of genes? I guess their genes were different. <laughs> you see? Not only then did they pass a law against begging, they passed a law against people giving them charity. Yes, it was illegal to, to even give them things, I'm telling you. In fact, they had to get a license to beg. So you could be arrested for begging without a license. Okay. That's law. Law. Not personality change. Not genes. But what? One group deciding that it is in its interest to make law. And in making that law creates, creating what? A criminal class. And creating criminal and so forth. And I tell you, one of the laws, and I know some of you are going to have a tough time with this. One of the major reasons why we have crime in this black community today is the law against drugs. Prohibition. The prohibition against drugs. Yes. I know it's a hard pill for you to swallow, but that's the way it is. What can I tell you? Let's go back to the prohibition against liquor, alcohol. What happens once the law is passed? Liquor becomes expensive, right? It's prohibited. Now it's worth money to do what? To smuggle it. So you begin to get what? Gangs of smugglers of what? Of whiskey. Because what? The law creates the created what? The value for it, made a market for it, and there was a group of people now that fed the need for people to drink. And suddenly now we had gangsters where we didn't have them before. Because of what? Law. Suddenly then people started shooting each other to gain control over the liquor territory. So they tried to tell you drive-by shooting started in the 80s, didn't they? No, no, drive-by shooting started with Capone and the rest of those boobs. They were shooting, Valentine's Massacre, okay? People dressed up with stick pins and big cars. Come on, you've got to be awake to what's going on here. Because what? Prohibition, the law structure itself, generated a type of criminality that did not exist before. 
Oh, you think these kids are interested in Tech Nine and oozes? You ever heard of the Tommy Gun? So the interest in what? Automatic weaponry and buying automatic weaponry did not start with black folk. It started during the what? Prohibition. There was a weapon used for prohibition. In other words, in the violence that we see, when you look, and here you do, you sit down and you look at the untouchables every night and you don't learn a single lesson from it, do you? Right. You sit right before your face. Drive-by shooting, automatic weapons, murder, death, killing, terrorism, the whole thing is right there. But the system makes you want to believe that this started with crack and crack cocaine and this comes out of the criminal personality of black young men. You understand? It's right there before your face. It came out of the law and the structure of the law and the structure of the justice system. You see? And they fight over territory and they fight over, over the earnings that come from it. And then like any people who are in a war, they choose the best weapon. This is what's going on. Understand me what I'm saying? So you got to look at the law. You got to look at the nature of the law and how this law and the construction of this country itself creates this situation. And you'll also recognize despite all of the fights that Elliot Ness went through, he didn't win it. Didn't win it. Didn't win it, did he? And what had to happen ultimately? They had to repeal the law. With the repealing of the law, certain types of what? Criminality and violence went away. Now, we have a heavy choice. I'm not advocating necessarily the legalization of drugs, but you got to think. And main thing I do want to do is just kind of crack your mind open a little bit before you're just too quick with the moral condemnations and the psychological condemnations. I can say that as a psychologist, you see, <laughs> and all of this other stuff that you've got to look in a broader situation than we're looking here. You see, so you got to look at how the economic structure of America contributes to the disorganization and destruction of the black community. You got to look at how the criminal justice system itself uh, uh, contributes to this. You got to look at how the whole um, uh, global economy is operating, how immigration also is having a major impact and other things if you're really concerned about genuine solutions. Thank you for your attention. Did you get your money's worth? Oh, yeah. We'll entertain questions at this time. If you step up to the mic and uh, and, and please uh, make it a question and, and not a statement. Okay, uh, Mr. Dr. Wilson, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, about two years or three years ago when I first heard you uh, speak at the Third Eye Conference, and it was really an eye-awakening experience for me because that was really a turning point that really opened my third eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing that I realized it was that it was the false images that had uh, had my eye covered. And so you kind of you really alluded to that, but you really kind of today really hit on uh, uh, the, the laws and the Constitution, and uh, and I really was well, as I was sitting there thinking, and uh, if you in and you just made me think about pro prostitution and constitution mm -hmm. and so you yeah. talked about the play on words and um, the other thing that I thought about was um, uh, there was an old saying by, by us I can't recall who it was but it says we have nothing to fear but fear itself and even within those, that little phrase it has uh, it says that we have nothing but fear mm -hmm. and so how, do, how does someone begin to conquer uh, I guess the subliminal messages mm -hmm. in, in, in words and in statements mm -hmm. we uh, of course the classic method is by going through self-examination and through a, a force of will to understand uh, reality, you see, and to admit straightforwardly that the approaches that one have, has tried earlier, have tried earlier, are failing to occur. And the willingness then to suspend for a moment uh, emotional and other kinds of strong attachments 
to answers that have not, uh, to approaches that have not worked and dare to think uh, in a very different sort of way, to face the anxiety of being different and of, uh, and of uh, thinking differently, to dare to deviate from the uh, beaten path that we hear about uh, so often and that makes us feel comfortable but uh, destroys us. How do you know that you're suffering from a compensatory fantasy? Uh, when you look at the fact that your life is in danger, that you're not gaining what it is you wish, you see. And now we have objective measures. You know, we've had this dream, we've had this ideology. Let's look objectively now at where we are as a people, you see. Let's look at unemployment, let's look at health, let's look at family, uh, our family situation, you see. Let's look at this, let's look at that. Let's look at what's going on in the world. Let's look at how the world actually deals with races that are weak and, and so forth and so on. Uh, so, so when you look at that and look at those measures, and see the Urban League puts them out every year, <laughs> you know, every year. There's a measure, the state of black America. And every year it's, it's the same thing. And yet you see them going against their very data, you know, and coming up with the same tired and unworkable approaches, you see. So this is how you begin to measure. In other words, you have to do what we call reality testing. Does it, is it working in reality? And daring to, uh, to speak out against it and daring to, to take the risks and the chances uh, to change those circumstances. You have to become also, and you're not going to carry a lot of people with you, but you don't need a lot of people. You need a good solid core of people to serve as models for change and to demonstrate that your ideology actually works and, uh, and you can gain more and more adherence as the, to the degree that you begin to demonstrate the effectiveness of what you are about. Ultimately, this is also a part of African-centered education. And African-centered education requires that you question every assumption. Everything that you've taken for granted as a member of this society should be put up to question. There should be no sacred cows no sacred ideologies, no sacred ideas, no unquestionable, you know, what have you. You got to bring it all up and look at it and question it and work and work it through again and again so you can begin to uh, break this thing down, you see. So, and uh, you got to even look at it from the African point of view. You just can't say, well, we practice this 10,000 years as African people and let some people lay that on you too. You got to also measure that, you know. Hey, where does it work? Where does it lead to? What is the logical outcome of this belief? Why didn't it work for African people then? You know, what's the situation? So it's, it, it, as Paula Freer says in, you know, in uh, uh, Pedagogy of Press, the main thing you have to engage people in is critical analysis and asking very critical questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Wilson, in the Metroplex, we had a, <clears throat> a hate crime killing in a, it, it led us to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, 15,000 and some marchers uh, went to Fort Worth. And as I watched this, uh, I came up with the conclusion because it was uh, 15,000 people listening to, once again, a bunch of preachers talking about peaceful uh, rallies. Mm -hmm. And why the peaceful rally was going on inside the building, these are pictures. Mm -hmm. the, uh, White power structure had dogs and, and uh, soldiers, and not soldiers, mm -hmm. but police, waiting for anything to go wrong to attack mm -hmm. the 15,000 that uh, mm -hmm. was peacefully marching. Mm -hmm. And I came up with the conclusion, and chronologically looking at history, that we as uh, Africans disassociate from power. And I, and I use the content that uh, when Stokely Carmichael coming to right now in the uh, 66 threw up the black power sign, that NAACP, uh, in print, in press, in print, mm -hmm. disassociated themselves yes. from black power. How can you be a black uh, organization this sir? And also, mm -hmm. when you talk about the black Panthers, you talk about mm -hmm. Malcolm X, you talk about the march on Washington when Slick, mm -hmm. uh, John Lewis got ready to do a speech talking about John F. Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, black establishment told him he had to change it or he wouldn't be able to make the speech. Mm -hmm. So in every instant in our history, we disassociate from power 
And I thought I had came to the conclusion because we're afraid to die, but I proved that wrong when I kept studying how many people would have lost in other wars. <laughs> so when are we going to learn to die for the right reason? <laughs> yeah. I appreciate your, I appreciate your comment there uh, very much. You know, we were a nation, uh, and we really thought ourselves as a nation. Like many nations, you know, your leadership would come up for question and evaluation ever so often. And you would measure, you know, you know, like the president, you say, are you better off than you were four years ago, you know? And if people decide they're not, they kick the guy out. But, you know, we, we, we keep getting this leadership here that has failed us time and time again. And yet it comes back again and again. And we have not sat there and looked at the record and say, but you've been providing this leadership now for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And look at what we're in. It's time for you to be displaced. There's a place and time for almost any kind of tactic. There's a place and time for peaceful march, but you gotta, it's a strategy. You see, there's a place and time uh, those of you in the Bible, you know about it. Ecclesiastes, right? Season and the time, the time for this and the time for that. You know, and so the idea is choosing what? The appropriate time. This becomes the essence, you see, uh, a part of the essence of normality. Knowing when and under what circumstances one must make certain moves. The neurotic person becomes stuck on one method, a one approach. And they use it regardless of its inappropriateness. And it creates all kinds of problems for them, you see. But the person who is maximally adaptive, you see, looks at a problem and, and determines what is perhaps the best way to uh, solve that problem and then uses a whole array of options. This is why it becomes dangerous to have only one kind of leadership. Because people tend to interpret and approach problems in terms of their professional orientation. See? And that's why I don't only read psychology and talk about psychology. See, if you're not if you're not careful as a psychologist, you can psychologize everything. <laughs> you see? And then you you know, you're working all on consciousness all day long, you know. <laughs> and, and that kind of stuff, not feeding people, employing people and stuff like that. And uh, the same thing happens to ministers. Everything becomes a moral problem. And all of it is a result of what? The lack of love between people. <laughs> you know? And so, you know, you can get caught up, and, and that's a part of it. But, you know, you can't get rigid around that. you got to also what? Deal with other issues. Problems are multi-causal. And when you're, caught, when you're in a profession, you have to be very careful not to let your profession focus you and blind you to other possibilities. And so often, you know, we've had this ministerial leadership, which on the whole has been good leadership in many ways. I, mean, I have to say that. But on other levels, it has cost us a lot because often the, the many, not, not all of them, by the way, but many have become, uh, have gotten tunnel vision. And they're going to solve all the problems through love. And uh, that ain't going to happen. And I tell you, and it's time for us then to bring to bear an array of people on our problem and to bring now into the forefront new types of leaders and people with uh, other kinds of perspectives in terms of what we are, are dealing with as, a, as people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Wilson, mm -hmm. you've talked a lot about economic strategies to uh, mm -hmm. pull us out of uh, various situations that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I realize that uh, we cannot uh, go back um, several centuries back before when traditional Africans, uh, you know, mm -hmm. did not deal in, in personal property and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. But yeah. um, my question has to do with, uh, since you've talked a lot about economic strategies, mm -hmm. do you think that capitalism as an economic and as an ideological system mm -hmm. is the type of system that we Africans should strive for mm -hmm. in terms of this pan-African global economy yeah. you keep referring to, you, mm -hmm. you're espousing capitalism? Not necessarily. No, I was saying that because I understand your question. I am very much in the middle now in this last chapter of trying to figure out, <laughs> try to, you know, come up with something as an alternative to 
capitalism. I am not satisfied with capitalism at all. I feel like uh, capitalism is a is a savage system. It's it's brutal, and uh, it's a type of what I call rationalized greed. You know. Um, and it's a greedy, mean system. Uh, I haven't quite worked it through. I'm really in the midst of working it through. But I just want to let you know, I have not, you know, accepted that. However, at the same time, I'm not millennial. <laughs> you know, I, I can't wait for the great classless, raceless age to occur when we all are going to get rid of the system and private property is going to go, go out in the whole bit. Our people need help right now, and we've got to survive right now. And so I figure at this point, the game is capitalism. And uh, we, we may as well just play it as hard as everybody else plays it. So in fact, you know, my, you know what, I, I have a sort of a cynical approach here. As a sense, people change things once black people get into the game. Maybe we really get into this game of capitalism real hard. They'll find another way out, particularly when, when they see we beating them at the game. And then they, I have another cynical approach that says, sometimes the best thing to do is just run a system into the ground. You know what I'm saying? If you want to play this kind of game and you want to play hardball, we're going to play hardball with you. So that, in a sense, then you're gonna learn that this perhaps is not your can, best. Can you honestly tell the average mm -hmm. African in America today that what they should do is to pursue capitalist pursuits as a way out of our our situation? I, I, mean, I, I, I can't. I look I can't at it this way. That. This is the way I look at it. Uh, I mean, the high capitalism runner and builds on, the, on the on the misery of other people. Uh huh. And we know this. Yes, I can say that. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can say. It. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, why am I going to say that? I don't see why people, why I should be the misery other people live off of. And I don't intend to be any sacrificial lamb for any other group of people. Okay? One of the best ways for you to keep capitalism in place is to become a sacrificial lamb for capitalists. Okay? And so the idea here is, look, if you're going to play this game, you're not going to play it on me. It's not a game I like. It's not a game I want. But at this point, it's not a game that I can change as well. And in the meanwhile, I'm not going to let you feed on my body. Now, one of the things that we have to face is what we call the zero-sum society. Some of you have seen uh, who it discusses that. You can find uh, Thoreau. Thoreau, yes. That's the Thoreau. Right out there on the shelf, zero sum society. What are we saying here? Some must win, and some what? Must lose. Unfortunately, we got a system, this so called capitalist system, that is unable, for, due to its nature and its logic, to provide people with a generally good living. And so sometimes we are in a forced choice situation that's unpleasant. And that forced choice situation says if we're in a zero sum game where somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose, then I'm going to go to win. We play basketball, we play football, we play every other kind of doggone ball to win. And yet things that are vital to our very lives and salvation, we want to back into a moral corner and die and curl up. I'm not going for that. Now, there has to be a better answer than I'm giving. I'm not telling you this is the final answer. I'm not arguing for this at all. Except to me, uh, I'm not ready for black people to continue to be victimized by other folk and to be the sacrificial lambs of the world. This is the role that the world has put us in, by the way. And you can see it all in the movies. You can bet the Negro is going to be the one that sacrifices his life. You know, are they going to be the emotional one? They're going to be full of love. How are the other people getting over? You know what I'm saying? I'm not going for that. The, re the reality is, if the world is structured where people have to struggle to survive, then let's get in on with the struggle and let's get it on. Okay? Yeah. Perhaps our doing so will hasten the end of capitalism. 
In fact, some writers now, I think Peter Drucker has a book called The Post-Capitalist Society. Uh, in a sense, these people know this game is pretty much up already. That uh, capitalism, they don't know which way to go with this system. In fact, it's to the point now where chances are it's headed for a tremendous crash. Uh, because uh, the markets are shrinking, uh, many of the exchange systems are out of control. Uh, even though these people are shipping industries and everything to Mexico and so forth, they still are not paying these new workers enough money to even buy their products and so forth. So they are in severe crisis. So one of the uh, things that I'm trying to do then, looking at the crisis of capitalism, is for us to ask the question, what is the best position for us to be in uh, should this thing collapse and fall? And I think at least one of the positions that we should be in is in control of our production, our means of production, and be in control as much as possible over our economic infrastructure and have some kind of economic lock on something so that when the thing switches over whether it will move over into some other form we could perhaps could be in a, in a better position than we are at this point where we own nothing we're not in control of anything uh, so that even in the new system we still may be, uh, be uh, out of the situation and maybe even our approach to capitalism may be uh, important as well. We tend to look at capitalism as African Americans as individualistically driven. But given our position as African people, I think if we're going to really challenge uh, the system, we're going to have to challenge it more in terms of cooperative and communal uh, work. You see. And uh, there's no reason why we cannot found businesses sponsored by nonprofit corporations. There's no reason why we can't have uh, what we call commonwealth corporations, where the community owns the corporation and the corporation owns businesses. You see, there's no reason why churches. Cannot, I guess churches or other nonprofit organizations cannot really go into business as organizations mainly to supply jobs, training, and other kind of opportunity without the profit motive being the chief motive, you see. And so even I think even possibly within this context, we can as a group approach our economic development in a way that um, – that is not a duplicate of what we see around us and yet protect our interests and help to promote maybe a new uh, approach and a new moral approach to, uh, to business. Now the other option we have, by the way, that I want to discuss is our collapsing capitalism, you see? But that's, that's a little difficult to tell black folk to do too. In other words, to a great extent, it exists because we cooperate with it. If, if we as African people and others would just stop cooperating with it for a while, we could collapse it within a short time that way as well. Yes. So, and, and force it then into to other things. So, you know, I'm, I'm, what I'm really doing more than anything else is provoking uh, thought. My mind is not closed at all. Certainly, I'm not going to settle on capitalism as it's currently defined, but I'm not at the same time, as I said earlier, willing just to lay down and die and uh, let it uh, run over us because uh, these capitalists, somebody's going to fight a war and something else is going to go on here. And I think we should be in a position to defend ourselves. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Jay Rogers uh, had a mm -hmm. comment about um, if you wanted to understand the new clan, you'd have to understand the old clan. Mm -hmm. uh, in doing some research along those same lines on our present education system, the clan was originated by ex-military people. Mm -hmm. There's a warfare tactic, which you mentioned, and strategy mm -hmm. out here that's, I think, been in effect 
and the civilian population, blacks, mm-hmm. are not aware of it. I think it's psychological warfare. Oh, yeah. The question I want to ask you mm-hmm. is, uh, have you done any research on how this is being done right now in the education system? Okay. You mean in terms of the Klan or, well, or just in general? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Definitely, uh, in mentioning the book, The Falsification of African Consciousness and Behavior, as you recall, of course, we, we deal with that in, in pretty good detail about uh, history as propaganda, history as mythology, about how uh, the organization of history serves to organize people's personality and structure. I think I might have mentioned to you, Pablo, to this audience some time ago about a very interesting history and uh, a very interesting uh, experiment in hypnosis uh, that dealt with what they call time. When uh, a hypnotist out there in New Jersey um, hypnotized a group of students and gave them post-hypnotic suggestions, and he changed their time sense. And some he told, uh, when you awaken from this, you know, hypnotic state, you will have no past. All your past will be gone. And uh, others he told, he elaborated their past and gave them a, an inflated past. Others he took the future uh, from them are inflated their future. And some he even removed their, their present from them. And it was very interesting the effects that these suggestions had on their personalities. Uh, the ones who had their history removed and their past removed uh, ex- um, projected orientations of lethargy laziness, lack of drive, low motivation, uh, sense of purposelessness and meaninglessness uh, in, in, their, in their lives, you see. A lack and the problem with a uh, sense of direction, you see. The ones who had their history inflated had, you know, the opposite effect in a sense, the, the increased ego, the increased pride, and the whole bit, and, and so forth. The ones, uh, and I can't recall all of it now, who had an inflated future, it's sort of like uh, going to heaven, you know, uh, experience, in a way they experience a, a type of pacified state. And a and a and a and a, and a, re- a state of relative uh, lack of anxiety because they weren't worried because they had this great future that was coming on, you know. So like many of our people, you know, they they don't deal with what's right in front of them or what's on the ground because they got this great thing coming in the in the future time. <laughs> and uh, and those who didn't have a future were caught up into immediate gratification, you see, and, and they were short-sighted, and uh, they had no vision, and so forth. So you see what I'm getting at, you see, history, history is a time dimension. Culture is a time dimension. History and culture form uh, a space-time grid, just as you have in algebra, you know, coordinates so that you, you can locate a point at different places, so many units from the x-axis, so many units from the y-axis, and you can place that person at uh, that point at a particular location. When you remove a people's past and when you remove their future, how do they know where they are and where they are going? and where they came from, how can they be other than caught up in immediate gratification? That's all they have. How can they not be short but short-sighted? 
and caught up with just their feelings, you see. And this is the kind of situation that has happened to African people. That's why I talked about uh, we have to move beyond a curriculum of inclusion because our history has been made discontinuous, you see. And therefore, many of us don't know how we got from where we were to where we are. And therefore, we can't relate ourselves to an axis of time and space, to the continent of Africa as a space, and to African history as a time, and therefore, therefore establish our location in the world and our identity in the world relative to everything else going on in the world. In giving up responsibility for ourselves, in placing our future in the hands of other people, in, in looking for other people to supply us with jobs, for other people to protect us against danger, for other people to feed us and to protect us and do all of this, we have literally ceded the future to them. And therefore, many of us are caught within a narrow present that is caught up so much in immediate gratification, immediate concerns, until we are constantly rolled over by the future and constantly caught by surprise and are constantly unprepared to deal with the problems that confront us. Other people think in terms of 50 years down the road, a hundred years down the road. You can't get our people to think in terms of two years down the road. You understand? And the writing of history and the writing about culture and the writing about many other things that are happening in the school is designed to create that mentality in us as a people. And it maintains that mentality in us as a people. A good deal of the violence that we're talking about here today is a result of the fact that our youngsters, along with many of us, are so caught up in the present, so caught up in immediate gratification, you see, that we don't have long-term goals and long-term commitments that stabilizes our behavior. You see, it's long-term goals and long-term commitments, a strong sense of purpose and destiny that you use psychologically to repress dangerous impulses and dangerous notions and get you to measure impulses and notions and desires against future goals and get you to say, hey, I want to go to this party, or hey, I want to you know, do this and do that, but this is going to jeopardize something that's very important to me down the road, you see, and you put the, the thing in check. But when people don't have a future commitment, when they don't have long-term goals, when that culture hasn't given them a sense of purpose and destiny, they have no reason not to gratify an impulse. Why? I ain't doing nothing. Why not? I ain't got nothing to do. You know? What's the point? I have no future. You hear some of the young tonight here say that right now. I have no future. It ain't going nowhere. So why don't I indulge myself? What's the point? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. You see? And to a great extent, the schools, as well as everything else in this culture, perpetrates that kind of consciousness. This is the reason why, again, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about an African-centered education, an African-centered education looks at the psycho-history of black people, you understand? And how the historical experience of black people has created general modes and trends in thinking and behaving. You understand? That's, that's what you look at, number one. And how it creates in us certain interests, certain desires that operate against our own long-term interests. This is why I tell people who engage in African-centered education, you must first develop a theory of learning. Why do we think the way we do as African people? How do we come to think the way we think? How do we come to behave the way we behave? In what way does this behavior benefit others and not ourselves? People, when they are made to live in a certain environment, 
to play certain roles in, 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 in a society, come to have a mentality that reflects that experience. You understand? Am I getting through here? See, this is why when you bring yourself and your children into these Eurocentric institutions, the thought styles and the behavioral styles and everything are what? Out of sync. You see, they have designed a school in line with their experience, in line with their goals, in line with their history, you see, in line with their role, their role as masters and controllers. And we come in and this look like walking into a foreign country. The whole mode of thinking, the language structure, the behavioral structure, sit down, be quiet, stop talking. We are very what? Sociocentric people. We come from an oral culture. An oral culture is a face-to-face -face culture where people transmit information more by face-to-face -face than by talking and so forth, you see. And, and of course, people who are held in concrete jobs and concrete positions tend to develop these kind of characteristics. So when they come into a school that's designed for people who are part of a what? A literate culture, people who are used to communicating long distances and therefore must be very careful about how words are put together and must be very good at evoking the right images through words because the person isn't right there in front of them, you see? And they don't take for granted that the person understands them immediately and so forth. We And you can see then, why a lot of us have problems, you understand? And African centered theory must understand this. This is why then, when you look at the experience of our people, you look then at the fact that we have a certain kind of learning style, not because we're African, but because of our experience. Now you develop a theory of learning, a theory of behavior. See, that's the reason why you got, I said earlier, you got to get rid of these labels, because see, these labels come from somewhere else. You got to develop a theory of time. How do you say you got your, want your children to learn the same thing at the same point, it's in the same amount, and then you say they come from the project and they come from this place and that place, right? And they have all these emotional things to deal with, and yet they must learn everything the white child learns at the same unit of time. That's, that's failure right there. If the school is appropriately designed, it will restructure school time, class time, a whole lot of other things to be appropriate to the people. Then you wouldn't have to talk about remedial edge. You're talking about giving children the appropriate amount of time for them to solve problems. You see? And then after you develop your theory of learning, why we think and behave the way we do, what kind of thinking and behavior characteristics do we have? Then you develop your pedagogical theory. How do you teach to this particular style? And how do you take your people from A to B? You see, and if your goal then is nation building, economic development, and the other kind of stuff, then you know where you want to go, what they must learn, what kind of characteristics must be developed, you know what is there, now you develop a theory and a means of what? Moving them through the transition into the other side. And so that's the reason why I tell people then, if you talk about an African-centered education, you're talking about drastic changes, not only in the content of education, but in the whole mode and design of the educational process. That's why before you start designing curricula and these kind of things, you must first come to know who the hell you are and how you came to be what you are and how other people have operated to create us for their own interests and how now we got to recreate ourselves in our own interests. I'm sorry for the lengthy answer, but you just provided me with an opportunity here with something I don't want to get caught because I think it's very important. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I would just like to uh, just ask you a question. You, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, yes. people need to uh, read the, some real history mm -hmm. as far as uh, America. Uh, did you see the uh, 60 Minutes, I think it was about two weeks ago, and they were talking about the triad? 
I did see it, but I'm familiar with the triad. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, and I noticed in there they were saying that the triad has moved into North America mm -hmm. and was uh, taking over the uh, drug trade. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, the triad, uh, according to, uh, I don't know if Mike, one of them was saying, mm -hmm. talking about, that the triad is uh, also uh, in collusion with, in their words, the communists in China. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and they were, as far as the currency, money going back, mm -hmm. uh, to move in to uh, when China takes over uh, Hong Kong in 1997. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, yes. Oh, and, and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I just want to ask you one follow up uh, uh -huh. because you mentioned something about. Uh, Prohibition earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and how it uh, so a lot of the violent stuff when mm -hmm. the gang wars and all that. Uh, once prohibition was uh, repealed, mm -hmm. uh, alcohol was just maybe just centered in, in certain people's hands, right? Mm -hmm. Who controlled uh, basically distribution of yes. alcohol, and not only in Dallas but in in, in, in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see? Let's say that because I think it's going to be a major move to uh, legalize uh, drugs, per se. Yeah. Uh, I, my, my question is, is who's mm -hmm. gonna control that? I mean, because it's gonna be legal. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I think, see, like in Dallas, there's a big issue about getting all of the, a lot of the liquor stores out of the, out of the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and which, in, in my opinion, which I agree to that to a certain degree, but once it leaves, uh, we don't own those liquors. Most of them, anyway, mm -hmm. we're not controlling the distribution of liquor. Uh, it leaves us with basically a, a nothing as far as a tax base mm -hmm. is concerned to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. but, but, well, how, are you, do you, are you sort of follow? Okay, let me yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, certainly, and I, I recognize the complexity of the problem we're dealing with. Often, sometimes, solution one way creates some problems another way. Sometimes, the choice isn't clean. It's a choice between, you know, the lesser of. And sometimes, certainly no one wants to advocate drugs, you know, and legal. But then, what I what has to be clear though, a lot of the violence that we talk about is connected there. Uh, if we say, well, we don't want to change the drug laws or change their drug approaches, uh, then we, we, we may as well face it. We got to live with the stuff that comes with it. And then there are a lot of other silly laws. Uh, even, and this is not my thing here. Uh, let me just quickly show you something that came out here on the 17th of, of April. Uh, citing police scandal, judge declares mistrial. Herman Ring trial is first directly uh, affected. What is happening here, the judge declared a, a mistrial. Federal judge yesterday declared a mistrial in a major narcotics case that she said had been tainted by police corruption scandal. Uh, prohibition corrupts police, it corrupts government, it corrupts the whole society. Even those who don't take drugs often are corrupted in the long run by, uh, by prohibition. Every week the government reveals new allegations of misconduct involving an ever-widening circle of police officers over an even longer period of time. So the very forces we're depending on to protect us against drugs, the influx of drugs, is itself being corrupted and, and done in. And so the, uh, I don't, you know, we're going to have to de uh, come to some kind of hard decision about what is going on here. Three members of the elite unit were accused in March of stealing heroin from drug dealers and selling it for $25,000. And several task force agents have been reassigned because of the scandal. Some of them here stole about $80,000. And of course, some of these guys are turning right around and selling, these cops are selling drugs in the black community and having our youngsters to sell drugs, which is a whole nother thing I couldn't get with here tonight, you see, of how this criminal justice system creates a class of criminals that cooperates with those in power. You see, and and serves as their instrument of illegality within the community itself. So while they are looking clean and being clean, they have our young men out here as mules and facing all the danger and the other kind of stuff. You see, uh, selling drugs that are enriching them as people. Yet they don't get caught. You don't see them on the TV screens. No one that talks about it. The same thing goes on with the guns. Who's selling the guns? What does the, how does the law contribute to guns? Do you know you can send to the federal government and get a license to sell guns, ABC? 
Do you know there are over 250,000, approaching 300,000 licensed gun dealers in this country? All you got to do is, is a, a right to the federal government and get it. Okay? Millions of guns are sold. So what are we saying here? Look at the law again. What is going on within the structure of society? How does the group that dominate use delinquency and criminality within our communities as a part of its scheme for domination, as a base for maintaining the subjugation of the black American community and a means of maintaining constant surveillance on our community and creating a force of terrorism and so forth within that community, you see. So this 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 is this is another part of uh, this thing. You see, ladies and gentlemen, these people are afraid we're just gonna wake up to what's going on and deal with it for what it is. Two judges, this came out also on the 17th, two judges declined drug cases, protesting sentencing rules. Two New York, two New York cities, prominent federal judges said yesterday that they no longer would preside over drug cases. Going public with the protest that calls attention to what dozens of federal judges are doing quietly. Up to about 50 or 60 federal judges now have decided that they're not gonna cover uh, drug cases. Why? Uh, the decision by Jack B. Weinstein and Whitman Knapp were made in protest against the national drug policies and federal sentencing guidelines. They're recognizing that their own system is screwing things up. They said that the emphasis on arrest and imprisonment, rather than what? Prevention and treatment had been a failure. When are we going to face the reality? You know one of the reasons why we don't face this reality? Because unlike the prohibition, the people who drank whiskey were white folk. A lot of white folk. You see? And now though, the, uh, this stuff is, has become so associated in the minds of people, even though there are far more white drug addicts than white folk. But it's become so associated in the minds of people with black people and so forth, and it's so lucrative for people in the other states here until they're having a hell of a time. When you look at the laws that were passed, by the way, you'll see that they, many of the prohibition laws were passed on a racist basis. The laws against opium were passed mainly against the Chinese. The laws against marijuana were passed mainly against the Mexicans. You see, so again, because we don't study history and understand what's going on, we fall victim to a lot of nonsense. Uh, they said, here these people wasting billions of dollars. Why are you spending all this money when prevention, education, Afrocentric education, and so forth, could do a far better job of reducing what's going on in the community than giving cops a whole lot of money? And not only then are they making that money, they're stealing even more. Had been a failure and that they were withdrawing from the effort. They no longer want to deal with it. Federal court officials estimated about 50 of the 680 federal district judges are refusing to take drug cases. A handful of federal judges have called for the legalization of drugs, and a few judges have resigned rather than apply what they regard as overly harsh sentences. The present policy of trying to prohibit drugs through the use of criminal law is a mistake. You're not stopping people from frequenting prostitutes through criminal law. You're not stopping these white people from practicing racism, even though you got all kinds of laws against that. You know, you got to face the fact that what people want to do real bad, they find a way of doing it, you know. And uh, so he says it's a policy that's not working. It's not cutting down drug use. The best way to do it is through education. A lot of judge feels that the present system breeds injustice, said federal district judge William Swartzer. He said that many judges feel that the sentencing rules enacted by Congress that provide for little or no judicial discretion load up the prisons, but have not done much else to improve the drug situation. People think that they can stop drug traffic by putting people in jail and by having terribly long sentences. But of course, it won't do any good. You got people being sent to jail for four and a half years, 10 years for uh, selling a $10 uh, crack vial. This is crazy. What you're doing, and, and you got people here with state mandates spending long times in prison. 60% or more of the people in these prisons today with long sentences are in there for nonviolent offenses. You see, but because again of this image associated with drugs and dealing and so forth, and uh, we're getting 
our young men and people in these jails for very long periods of time, no rehabilitation, no training for learning to be criminals, getting themselves distorted and twisted by the criminal system, being bought back out and being put back in as a result of this kind of game. So it's time for us as African people, you see, to become more realistic, to face some issues that we've been reluctant to face and deal with those issues. The other thing about your Chinese thing, the triad groups have been around, you know, since way back. It's an old game. People, as immigrants move into this country, they also import their criminal groups. I mean, if you talk about the Russians, you'll find in New York City, the Russian criminals are right over there in Brooklyn doing their thing. And uh, as other groups come in, they bring their criminals with them and they work uh, their numbers. And this is, this is what uh, is going on in that situation. And these people are going to use whatever means they can, criminal or otherwise, to ultimately suck America dry of its resources to advance their own interests. And this is another thing that we as black people have to face as well. But this country is guilty of the same thing. It's willing to support all kinds of dictators. Mobutu is Zaire. No matter how many people he oppresses and black folk and money he steals. It's ready to support Savimbi and the death and maiming and killing of hundreds and thousands of African people. It has supported all types of crooks and criminals all over the world in order to achieve its end. This is the way governments and people operate, you know. We are such a moral people, and that's wonderful. We are so nice, and we're going to die nice, you know. And we're going to die moral because we don't want to face what really goes on in the world. And this is a nasty, brutish world that we live in. And now, that's our decision. If we want to die, you know, then we should say up front, we're going to be moral if it kills us. You know, let's just go with it. But let's not play games with ourselves and pretend that we want to survive and we want to live and we want to do everything but what is required to live. That's all I'm trying to say. There's nothing wrong with saying, look, I'm not going to behave that way if it kills me, if it destroys me, fine. But let's be honest about the doggone thing, you know. Let's not pretend that these little nam to family approaches that we're using are going to resolve the issues because other people don't give a hoot about our morality and stuff at all. You know, in fact, they use it. When I mentioned about these Koreans earlier, these people Look what they're doing to black folk up there. After all of this sacrifice and enriching of the Koreans, they now said, they came right out on the 22nd of March and said, now that we've got economic power, we want political power, which is the way people do it. I've been trying to tell black people, forget about these politicians and all this other nonsense. Develop economic power first. In a capitalist society, Money is power. You do not have power if you do not have money and control of economic resources. I don't care how many people you elect. I don't care how many judges you put on the court bench. You don't have power, I'm telling you. Well, what did I tell you? The more black judges you put on these courts, what happened? The more black men have gone to jail. That's right. Look at it. Yes. They, they keep up with one another. Each new appointee, black on the court, new men going into jailhouse. Has not changed. See, but the black bourgeoisie wants to deceive you. Put us, what is it? Vote for me and I'll set you free. You, you better, shit. <laughs> it's just the opposite. The more you vote for them, the more you go to jail. That's right. You get mayors, and what do they do? Preside over the de deterioration, destruction of the black community. You had a black secretary of health, and what happened? The black community was hit by AIDS, tuberculosis, drugs. You know, every side, even the black lifespan started going backwards. You understand what I'm saying? We got to face reality. You get a black uh, uh, general head in the U.S. Army, what happens? You attack black countries. You know what I'm saying? Let's be real. You get Thurgood Marshall, sit him on the Supreme Court, and what does he do? Grow old watching his struggles do what? Be turned back by the Supreme Court. He got more out of that court as a lawyer than he did as a judge sitting on the bench. You know what I'm saying? But we still go for this okie doke you see. 
and, and we could go from one to the other. You got a black secretary of housing. What was the major problem under that black secretary of housing? Homelessness. <laughs> okay. Why? Because you're misinterpreting what real power is. Real power is not the electing of bourgeois Negroes to office. They want to break up run that game on you, see? And tell me, my, ain't we advancing because they got a job? You know, and I always ask you, did they put a nickel in your pocket? Do you understand? So the deal is, now where does power really come from in this kind of society? It comes from the owning of wealth and the controlling of wealth. You don't even have to be in office. You don't even have to be elected to manipulate offices and political system if you have wealth and know how to use it, you see. But you've been concentrating so much on symbolisms and on image and all the other stuff until you've forgotten the development of economic power and wealth and other groups have slipped right in under us they weren't running for office and hollering about voting and all of that. They came in and got the money, and now that they got the money and the wealth, they are now ready to exercise their influence in the country. And this is what the Koreans said. Now we're ready. Now we want all the mayor candidates to come by us. And we got certain demands that we want them to meet if they get our 6,000 votes. <laughs> they got 6,000 votes now. Now, you say, wow, that's ridiculous when you got over two million people, you know, in, in New York, three million black folk. How can they think? But they got money. Money weighs against votes any day. You see? And they know that. And uh, they had three demands. One demand was now that they, they said, we, now that we monopolize the retail end of the business, the food business, and, and so forth, we now want the mayor, the new mayor, whoever he or she may be, to give us permission or whatever to support our drive to create a new cooperative uh, wholesale market. In other words now, they're not going to buy their vegetables and produce and grocery anymore but through the whites who still have control of the produce markets and the grocery market, they now are going to have their own produce and grocery market so they control what? Both ends of the deal lower prices and knock all the other people out. You understand? That's what they're demanding now. And uh, that's one of the demands that they wanted. The only group they said they wanted to reach out for was the Dominicans because the Dominicans in New York are also heavy into the food market. So what you got here is going here is a syndicate that says, okay, let's two get together. This is their multiculturalism, you see, and lock this food market up. And once we lock it up, even these Negroes, once they get the economic spirit and they're really going to try to own something, they still ain't going to be able to get in because now we got both what? The production end of the deal and the retail end of the deal. We own the building, so now we can keep them out of competition because we can keep the rent up, we can make them pay higher prices, we can lock them out of the retail situation, and they're dead and done. This is multiculturalism for you, ladies and gentlemen, and it's right up front. Right up front, nobody's hiding it. What was the other demand they wanted? Rezoning of New York City, particularly Manhattan. Why? To keep the path mark, the big supermarkets, the Kmarts and so forth, out of the downtown area. So that those big markets could not do what? Undercut them and knock them out. Very straightforward. No, 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 let's love together. Let's let them come on in. You know, uh uh. No, this is our business. This is where we feed our families. This is what it's about. We're going to block you out. And we want you, the mayor, to see about it. The third thing they made was quite interesting, too. The third demand they made was we want all, quote unquote, illegal vendors pushed off the street. And we want even the legal ones severely restricted. You know where that's coming, don't you? You walk into Manhattan, you walk down Harlem, what do you see? All of these Africans, people, on the sidewalk, vending, from one long block to the other. You go to Brooklyn, all of these African and black people, why? They can't get into the stores, the Koreans and other people got the inside of the stores. So they are what? Forced outside to sell on the sidewalk.